Book One, Sections One through Five of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book One, Section One through Five. Book One, Section One. Every state is a community of some kind, and every community is established with a view to some good. For mankind always act in order to obtain that which they think good. But if all communities aim at some good, the state or political community, which is the highest of all and which embraces all the rest, aims at good in a greater degree than any other, and at the highest good. Some people think that the qualifications of a statesman, king, householder and master are the same, and that they differ not in kind, but only in the number of their subjects. For example, the ruler over a few is called a master, over more the manager of a household, over a still larger number a statesman or king, as if there were no difference between a great household and a small state. The distinction which is made between the king and the statesman is as follows. When the government is personal, the ruler is a king. When, according to the rules of the political science, the citizens rule, and are ruled in turn, then he is called a statesman. But all this is a mistake, for governments differ in kind, as will be evident to anyone who considers the matter according to the method which has hitherto guided us. As in other departments of science, so in politics the compound should always be resolved into the simple elements, or least parts of the whole. We must therefore look at the elements of which the state is composed, in order that we may see in what the different kinds of rule differ from one another, and whether any scientific result can be obtained about each one of them. Section 2. He who thus considers things in their first growth and origin, whether a state or anything else, will obtain the clearest view of them. In the first place, there must be a union of those who cannot exist without each other, namely of male and female, that the race may continue. And this is a union which is formed not of deliberate purpose, but because, in common with other animals and with plants, mankind have a natural desire to leave behind them an image of themselves, and of a natural ruler and subject, that both may be preserved. For that which can foresee by the exercise of mind is by nature intended to be lord and master, and that which can with its body give effect to such foresight is a subject, and by nature a slave. Hence master and slave have the same interest. Now nature has distinguished between the female and the slave, for she is not niggardly, like the smith who fashions the Delphian knife for many uses. She makes each thing for a single use, and every instrument is best when intended for one and not for many uses. But among barbarians no distinction is made between women and slaves, because there is no natural ruler among them. They are a community of slaves, male and female, Wherefore, the poets say, It is meet that Hellenes should rule over barbarians, as if they thought that the barbarian and the slave were by nature one. Of these two relationships, between a man and woman, master and slave, the first thing to arise is the family, and Hesiod is right when he says, First house and wife, and an ox for the plough. For the ox is the poor man's slave, the family is the association established by nature for the supply of men's everyday wants, and the members of it are called by Carandus, companions of the cupboard, and by Epimenides the Cretan, companions of the manger. But when several families are united, and the association aims at something more than the supply of daily needs, the first society to be formed is the village, and the most natural form of the village appears to be that of a colony from the family composed of the children and grandchildren, who are said to be suckled with the same milk. And this is the reason why Hellenic states were originally governed by kings, because the Hellenes were under royal rule before they came together, as the barbarians still are. Every family is ruled by the eldest, and therefore in the colonies of the family the kingly form of government prevailed because they were of the same blood. As Homer says, each one gives law to his children and to his wives, for they lived dispersedly, as was the manner in ancient times. Wherefore men say that gods have a king, 
because they themselves either are or were in ancient times under the rule of a king, for they imagine not only the forms of the gods, but their ways of lives to be like their own. When several villages are united in a single complete community, large enough to be nearly or quite self-sufficing, the state comes into existence, originating in the bare needs of life and continuing in existence for the sake of a good life. Therefore, if the earlier forms of society are natural, so is the state, for it is the end of them, and the nature of a thing is its end. For what each thing is when fully developed we call its nature, whether we are speaking of a man, a horse, or a family. Besides, the final cause and the end of a thing is the best, and to be self-sufficing is the end and the best. Hence, it is evident that the state is a creation of nature, and that man is, by nature, a political animal. And he who, by nature, and not by mere accident, is without a state, is either a bad man or above humanity. He is like the tribeless, lawless, hearthless one whom Homer denounces. The natural outcast is forthwith a lover of war. He may be compared to an isolated peace at draughts. Now, that man is more of a political animal than bees or any other gregarious animals is evident. Nature, as we often say, makes nothing in vain, and man is the only animal whom she has endowed with the gift of speech. And whereas mere voice is but an indication of pleasure or pain, and is therefore found in other animals, for their nature attains to the perception of pleasure and pain, and the intimation of them to one another, and no further. The power of speech is intended to set forth the expedient and inexpedient, and therefore likewise the just and unjust. And it is a characteristic of man that he alone has any sense of good or evil, of just and unjust, and the like. And the association of living beings who have this sense makes a family and a state. Further, the state is by nature clearly prior to the family and to the individual, since the whole is of necessity prior to the part. For example, if the whole body be destroyed, there will be no foot or hand, except in an equivocal sense, as we might sense of a stone hand, when destroyed the hand will be no better than that. But things are defined by their working and power, and we ought not say that they are the same when they no longer have their proper quality, but only that they have the same name. The proof that the state is the creation of nature and prior to the individual is that the individual, when isolated, is not self-sufficing, and therefore he is like a part in relation to the whole. But he who is unable to live in society, or who has no need because he is sufficient for himself, must either be a beast or a god, for he is no part of a state. A social instinct is implanted in all men by nature, and yet he who first founded the state was the greatest of benefactors. For man, when perfected, is the best of animals, but when separated from law and justice, he is the worst of all since armed injustice is the more dangerous, and he is equipped at birth with arms, meant to be used by intelligence and virtue, which he may use for the worst ends. Wherefore, if he have not virtue, he is the most unholy and most savage of animals, and most full of lust and gluttony. But justice is the bond of men and states, for the administration of justice, which is the determination of what is just, is the principle of order in political society. 3. Seeing, then, that the state is made up of households, before speaking of the state, we must speak of the management of the household. The parts of household management correspond to the persons who compose the household, and a complete household consists of slaves and freemen. Now we should begin by examining everything in its fewest possible elements, and that the first and fewest possible parts of a family are master and slave, husband and wife, father and children. We have, therefore, to consider what each of these three relations is and ought to be. I mean the relation of master and servant, the marriage relation, the conjunction of man and wife, has no name of its own. And thirdly, the procreative relation. This also has no proper name. And there is another element of a household, the so-called art of getting wealth, which, according to some, is identical with household management, according to others, a principal part of it. The nature of this art will also have to be considered by us. Let us first speak of master and slave, looking to the needs of practical life, and also seeking to attain some better theory of their relation than exists at present. 
for some are of the opinion that the rule of a master is a science, and that the management of a household, and the mastership of slaves, and the political and royal rule, as I was saying at the outset, are all the same. Others affirm that the rule of a master over slaves is contrary to nature, and that the distinction between slave and freeman exists by law only, and not by nature, and being in interference with nature is therefore unjust. 4. Property is a part of the household, and the art of acquiring property is a part of the art of managing the household. For no man can live well, or indeed live at all, unless he be provided with necessaries. And as in the arts which have a definite sphere, the workers must also have their own proper instruments for the accomplishment of their work, so it is in the management of a household. Now instruments are of various sorts, some are living, others lifeless. In the rudder, the pilot of a ship has a lifeless, in the lookout man a living instrument. For in the arts the servant is a kind of instrument. Thus, too, a possession is an instrument for maintaining life. And so, in the arrangement of a family, a slave is a living possession, the property a number of such instruments, and the servant is himself an instrument which takes precedence over all other instruments. For if every instrument could accomplish its own work, obeying or anticipating the will of others, like the statues of Daedalus, or the tripods of Hephaestus, which says the poet, of their own accord entered the assembly of the gods, if, in like manner, the shuttle would weave and the plectrum touched the lyre without a hand to guide them, chief workmen would not want servants, nor master slaves. Here, however, another distinction must be drawn. The instrument commonly so called are instruments of production, whilst a possession is an instrument of action. The shuttle, for example, is not only of use, but something else is made of it, whereas of a garment or of a bed there is only the use. Further, as production and action are different in kind, and both require instruments, the instruments which they employ must likewise differ in kind. But life is action, and not production, and therefore the slave is the minister of action. Again, a possession is spoken of as a part is spoken of, for the part is not only a part of something else, but wholly belongs to it, and this is also true of a possession. The master is only the master of the slave, he does not belong to him whereas the slave is not only the slave of his master, but wholly belongs to him. Hence we see what is the nature and office of a slave. He who is by nature not his own, but another's man, is by nature a slave, and he may be said to be another's man, who, being a human being, is also a possession. And a possession may be defined as an instrument of action, separable from the possessor. 5. But is there any one thus intended by nature to be a slave, and for whom such a condition is expedient and right, or rather is not all slavery a violation of nature? There is no difficulty in answering this question, on grounds both of reason and of fact, for that some should rule, and others be ruled as a thing not only necessary, but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjugation, others for rule. And there are many kinds, both of rulers and subjects and that the rule is better which is exercised over better subjects. For example, to rule over men is better than to rule over wild beasts. For the work is better, which is executed by better workmen. And where one man rules and another is ruled, they may be said to have a work. For in all things which can form a composite whole, and which are made up of parts, whether continuous or discrete, a distinction between the ruling and the subject element comes to the fight. Such a duality exists in living creatures, but not in them only. It originates in the constitution of the universe. Even in things which have no life, there is a ruling principle, as in a musical mode. But we are wandering from the subject. We will therefore restrict ourselves to the living creature, which in the first place consists of a soul and body. And of these two, the one is by nature the ruler, and the other the subject. But we must look for intentions of nature in things which retain their nature and not in things which are corrupted. And therefore we must study the man who is in the most perfect state both of body and soul, for in him we shall see the true relation of the two, although in bad or corrupted natures the body will often appear to rule over the soul, because they are in an evil and unnatural condition. At all events we may firstly observe in living creatures both a despotical and a constitutional rule, for the soul rules the body with a despotical rule, 
whereas the intellect rules the appetites with the constitutional and royal rule. And it is clear that the rule of the soul over the body and of the mind and the rational element over the passionate is natural and expedient, whereas the equality of the two or the rule of the inferior is always hurtful. The same holds good of animals in relation to men, for tame animals have a better nature than wild, and all tame animals are better off when they are ruled by man, for then they are preserved. Again, the male is by nature superior, and the female inferior, and the one rules, and the other is ruled. This principle of necessity extends to all mankind. Where, then, there is such a difference as that between soul and body, or between men and animals, as in the case of those whose business is to use their body and can do nothing better. The lower sort are by nature slaves, and it is better for them, as for all inferiors, that they should be under the rule of a master. For he who can be, and therefore is, and others, and he who participates in rational principle enough to apprehend, but not to have such a principle, is a slave by nature. Whereas the lower animals cannot even apprehend a principle, they obey their instincts. And indeed, the use made of slaves and of tame animals is not very different, for both with their bodies minister to the needs of life. Nature would like to distinguish between the bodies of free men and slaves, making the one strong for servile labor, the other upright, and although useless for such services, useful for political life and the arts both of war and peace. But the opposite often happens, that some have the souls and others have the bodies of free men. And doubtless, if men differed from one another in the mere forms of their bodies as much as the statues of the gods do from men, all would acknowledge that the inferior class should be the slaves of the superior. And if this is true of the body, how much more just than a similar distinction should exist in the soul. But the beauty of the body is seen, whereas the beauty of the soul is not seen. It is clear, then, that some men are by nature free, and others slaves, and that for these latter slavery is both expedient and right. End of chapter 1, section 1 through 5. Book 1, Sections 6 through 9 of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 1, Sections 6 through 9. Section 6. But that those who take the opposite view have, in a certain way, right on their side, may be easily seen. For the words slavery and slave are used in two senses. There is a slave or slavery by law, as well as by nature. The law of which I speak is a sort of convention. The law by which whatever is taken in war is supposed to belong to the victors. But this right many jurists impeach, as they would an orator who has brought forward an unconstitutional measure. They detest the notion that, because one man has the power of doing violence and is superior in brute strength, another shall be a slave and subject. Even among philosophers there is a difference of opinion. The origin of the dispute, and what makes the views invade each other's territory, is as follows. In some sense virtue, when furnished with means, has actually the greatest power of exercising force, and as superior power is only found where there is superior excellence of some kind. Power seems to imply virtue, and the dispute to be simply one about justice, for it is due to one party identifying justice with good will, while the other identifies it with the mere rule of the stronger. If these views are thus set out separately, the other views have no force or plausibility against the view that the superior in virtue ought to rule or be master. Others, clinging as they think simply to a principle of justice, for law and custom are a sort of justice, assume that slavery in accordance with the custom of war, is justified by law. But at the same moment they deny this. For what if the cause of the war be unjust? And again, no one would ever say he is a slave who is unworthy to be a slave. For if this were the case, men of the highest rank would be slaves, and the children of slaves if they or their parents chanced to have been captive and sold. Wherefore, Hellenes do not like to call other Hellenes slaves, but confine the term to barbarians. Yet, in using this language... They really mean the natural slave of whom we spoke at first. For it must be admitted that some are slaves everywhere, others nowhere. 
The same principle applies to nobility. Hellenes regard themselves as noble everywhere, and not only in their own country, but they deem the barbarians noble only when at home, thereby implying that there are two sorts of nobility and freedom, the one absolute and the other relative. The Helen of Theodectus says, Who would presume to call me servant, who am on both sides sprung from the stem of the gods? What does this mean but that they distinguish freedom and slavery, noble and humble birth, by the two principles of good and evil? They think that as men and animals beget men and animals, so from good men a good man springs. But this is what nature, though she may intend it, cannot always accomplish. We see then that there is some foundation for this difference of opinion, and that all are not either slaves by nature or freemen by nature, and also that there is in some cases a marked distinction between the two classes, rendering it expedient and right for the one to be slaves and the others to be masters, the one a practicing obedience, the other exercising the authority and lordship which nature intended them to have. The abuse of this authority is injurious to both, for the interests of part and whole, of body and soul, are the same, and the slave is a part of the master, a living but separated part of his bodily frame. Hence, where the relation of master and slave between them is natural, they are friends, and have a common interest, but where it rests merely on law and force, the reverse is true. Section 7. The previous remarks are quite enough to show that the rule of a master is not a constitutional rule, and that all the different kinds of rule are not, as some affirm, the same with each other. For there is one rule exercised over subjects who are by nature free, another over subjects who are by nature slaves. The rule of a household is a monarchy, for every house is under one head, whereas constitutional rule is a government of free men and equals. The master is not called a master because he has science, but because he is of a certain character, and the same remark applies to the slave and the freeman. Still, there may be a science for the master, and science for the slave. The science of the slave would be such as the man of Syracuse taught, who made money by instructing slaves in their ordinary duties. For such a knowledge may be carried further, so as to include cookery and similar menial arts. For some duties are the more necessary, others of the more honorable sort. As the proverb says, slave before slave, master before master. But all such branches of knowledge are servile. There is likewise a science of the master, who teaches the use of slaves. For the master as such is concerned, not with the acquisition, but with the use of them. Yet this so-called science is not anything great or wonderful, for the master need only know how to order that which the slave must know how to execute. Hence those who are in a position which places them above toil have stewards who attend to their households, while they occupy themselves with philosophy or with politics. But the art of acquiring slaves, I mean of justly acquiring them, differs both from the art of the master and the art of the slave, being a species of hunting or war. Enough of the distinction between master and slave. Section 8. Let us now inquire into property generally, and into the art of getting wealth, in accordance with our usual method, for a slave has been shown to be a part of property. The first question is whether the art of getting wealth is the same with the art of managing a household, or a part of it, or instrumental to it, and if the last, whether in the way that the art of making shuttles is instrumental to the art of weaving, or in the way that the casting of bronze is instrumental to the art of the statuary, for they are not instrumental in the same way, but the one provides tools and the other material, and by material I mean the substratum out of which any work is made. Thus wool is the material of the weaver, bronze of the statuary. Now, it is easy to see that the art of household management is not identical with the art of getting wealth, for the one uses the material which the other provides. For the art which uses household stores can be no other than the art of household management. There is, however, a doubt whether the art of getting wealth is a part of the household management or a distinct art. If the getter of wealth has to consider whence wealth and property can be procured, but there are many sorts of property and riches, then are husbandry, in the care and provision of food in general, parts of the wealth-getting art or distinct arts. Again, there are many sorts of food, and therefore there are many kinds of lives, both of animals and men. They must all have food, and the differences in their food have made differences in their ways of life. 
For of beasts, some are gregarious, others are solitary. They live in the way which is best adapted to sustain them, accordingly as they are carnivorous, or herbivorous, or omnivorous. And their habits are determined for them by nature in such a manner that they may obtain with greater faculty the food of their choice. But, as different species have different tastes, the same things are not naturally pleasant to all of them. And therefore the lives of carnivorous or herbivorous animals further differ among themselves. In the lives of men, too, there is great difference. The laziest are shepherds, who lead an idle life and get their subsistence without trouble from tame animals. Their flocks having to wander from place to place in search of pasture, they are compelled to follow them, cultivating a sort of living farm. Others support themselves by hunting, which is of different kinds. Some, for example, are brigands. Others who dwell near lakes or marshes or rivers or a sea in which there are fish are fishermen and others live by the pursuit of birds or wild beasts. The greater number obtain a living from the cultivated fruits of the soil. Such are the modes of subsistence, which prevail among those whose industry springs up of itself, and whose food is not acquired by exchange and retail trade. There is the shepherd, the husbandman, the brigand, the fisherman, and the hunter. Some gain a comfortable maintenance out of two employments, eking out the deficiencies of one of them by another. Thus the life of a shepherd may be combined with that of a brigand, the life of a farmer with that of a hunter. Other modes of life are similarly combined in any way which the needs of men may require. Property, in the sense of a bare livelihood, seems to be given by nature herself to all, both when they are first born and when they are grown up. For some animals bring forth, together with their offspring, so much food as will last until they are able to supply themselves. Of this, the vermiparous or oviparous animals are an instance, and the viviparous animals have, up to a certain time, a supply of food for their young in themselves, which is called milk. In like manner, we may infer that, after the birth of animals, plants exist for their sake, and that the other animals exist for the sake of man, the tame for the use in food, the wild, if not all, at least the greater part of them, for food, and for the provision of clothing and various instruments. Now if nature makes nothing incomplete, and nothing in vain, the inference must be that she has made all animals for the sake of man. And so, in one point of view, the art of war is a natural art of acquisition. For the art of acquisition includes hunting, an art which we ought to practice against wild beasts, and against men who, though intended by nature to be governed, will not submit, for war of such kind is naturally just. Of the art of acquisition, then, there is one kind which is by nature a part of the management of a household, in so far as the art of household management must either find ready to hand or itself provide such things necessary to life and useful for the community of the family or state as can be stored. They are the elements of true riches, for the amount of property which is needed for a good life is not unlimited, though Solon in his poem says that no bound to riches has been fixed for man. But there is a boundary fixed, just as there is in the other arts, for the instruments of any kind are never unlimited, either in number or size, and riches may be defined as the number of instruments to be used in a household or an estate. And so we see that there is a natural art of acquisition which is practiced by managers of households and by statesmen, and what is the reason of this? 9. There is another variety of the art of acquisition, which is commonly and rightly called an art of wealth getting, and has in fact suggested the notion that riches and property have no limit. Being nearly connected with the preceding, it is often identified with it. But though they are not very different, neither are they the same. The kind being described is given by nature, the other is gained by experience and art. Let us begin our discussion of the question with the following considerations. Of everything which we possess there are two uses, both belong to the things as such, but not in the same manner, for one is the proper, and the other the improper or secondary use of it. For example, a shoe is used for wear, and is used for exchange. Both are the uses of the shoe. He who gives a shoe in exchange for money or food to him who wants one, does indeed use the shoe as a shoe. But this is not the proper or primary purpose, for a shoe is not made to be an object of barter. The same may be said of all possessions, for the art of exchange extends to all of them, 
and it arises at first from what is natural, from the circumstances that some have too little, others too much. Hence we may infer that retail trade is not a natural part of the art of wealth-getting. Had it been so, men would have ceased to exchange when they had enough. In the first community, indeed which is the family, this art is obviously of no use, but it begins to be useful when the society increases. For the members of the family originally had all things in common. Later, when the family divided into parts, the parts shared in many things, and different parts in different things, which they had to exchange in for what they wanted, a kind of barter which is still practiced among barbarian nations, who exchange with one another the necessaries of life, and nothing more, giving and receiving wine, for example, in exchange for coin and the like. This sort of barter is not part of the wealth-getting art, and is not contrary to nature, but is indeed needed for the satisfaction of men's natural wants. The other, or more complex form of exchange, grew, as might have been inferred, out of the simpler, when the inhabitants of one country became dependent on those of another, and they imported what they needed, and exported what they had too much of. Money necessarily came into use, for the various necessaries of life are not easily carried about, and hence men agreed to employ in their dealings with one another something which was intrinsically useful and easily applicable to the purposes of life for example, iron, silver, and the like. Of this, the value was at first measured simply by size and weight, but in the process of time they put a stamp on it to save the trouble of weighing and mark the value. When the use of coin had once been discovered, out of the barter of necessary articles arose the other art of wealth getting, namely retail trade, which was at first probably a simple matter, became more complicated as soon as men learned by experience whence and by what exchanges the greatest profit might be made. Originating in the use of coin, the art of getting wealth is generally thought to be chiefly concerned with it, and to be the art which produces riches and wealth, having to consider how they may be accumulated. Indeed, riches is assumed by many to be only a quantity of coin, because the arts of getting wealth and retail trade are concerned with coin. Others maintain that coin money is a mere sham, a thing not natural, but conventional only, because, if the users substitute another commodity for it, it is worthless, because it is not useful as a means to any of the necessities of life, and, indeed, he who is rich in coin may often be in want of necessary food. But how can that be wealth, of which a man may have a great abundance and yet perish with hunger, like Midas in the fable? whose insatiable prayer turned everything which was set before him into gold. Hence, men seek after a better notion of riches and the art of getting wealth than the mere acquisition of coin, and they are right. For natural riches and the natural art of wealth getting are a different thing. In their true form, they are part of the management of a household, whereas retail trade is the art of producing wealth, not in every way but by exchange and it is thought to be concerned with coin, for coin is the unit of exchange, and the measure or limit of it. And there is no bound to the riches which may spring from this art of wealth-getting. As in the art of medicine there is no limit to the pursuit of health, as in the other arts there is no limit to the pursuit of their several ends, but they aim at accomplishing their ends to the uttermost. But of the means there is a limit, for the end is always the limit. So, too, in this art of wealth-getting there is no limit of the end, which is the riches of the spurious kind, and the acquisition of wealth. But the art of wealth-getting, which consists in household management, on the other hand, has a limit. The unlimited acquisition of wealth is not its business. And therefore, in one point of view, all riches must have a limit. Nevertheless, as a matter of fact, we find the opposite to be the case. For all the getters of wealth increase their hoard of coin without limit. The source of the confusion is the near connection between the two kinds of wealth-getting, and either the instrument is the same, although the use is different, and so they pass into one another, for each is the use of the same property, but with a difference. Accumulation is the end in the one case, but there is a further end in the other. Hence, some persons are led to believe that the getting of wealth is the object of household management, and the whole idea of their lives is that they either ought to increase their money without limit, or at any rate not to lose it. The origin of this disposition in men is that they are intent upon living only, and not upon living well, and, as their desires are unlimited, they also desire that the means of gratifying them should be without limit. Those who do aim at a good life seek the means of obtaining bodily pleasures, and since the enjoyment of these appears to depend on property, 
they are absorbed in getting wealth. And so there arises the second species of wealth getting. For as their enjoyment is an excess, they seek an art which produces the excess of enjoyment. And if they are not able to supply their pleasures by the art of wealth getting, they try other arts, using in turn every faculty in a manner contrary to nature. The quality of courage, for example, is not intended to make wealth, but to inspire confidence. Neither is this the aim of the generals, or of the physician's art. But the one aims at victory, the other at health. Nevertheless, some men turn every quality or art into a means of getting wealth. This they conceive to be the end, and to the promotion of the end they think all things must contribute. Thus, then, we have considered the art of wealth-getting, which is unnecessary, and why men want it, and also the necessary art of wealth-getting, which we have seen to be different from the other, and to be a natural part of the art of managing a household, concerned with the provision of food, not, however, like the former kind, unlimited, but having a limit. End of Book 1, Section 6 through 9 Book 1, Sections 10-13 through 13 of Politics by Aristotle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Wetzel Politics by Aristotle Translated by Benjamin Joet Book 1, Sections 10-13 through 13. Section 10. And we have found the answer to our original question, whether the art of getting wealth is the business of the manager of a household and of the statesman, or not their business. Videla said that wealth is presupposed by them. For as political science does not make men, but takes them from nature and uses them, so too nature provides them with earth or sea or the like as a source of food. At this stage begins the duty of the manager of a household, who has to order the things which nature supplies. He may be compared to the weaver, who has not to make but to use wool, and to know, too, what sort of wool is good and serviceable, or bad and unserviceable. Were this otherwise, it would be difficult to see why the art of getting wealth is a part of the management of a household, and the art of medicine not. For surely the members of a household must have health, just as they must have life or any other necessity. The answer is that, as from one point of view, the master of the house and the ruler of the state have to consider about health, from another point of view not they but the physician. So in one way the art of household management, in another way the subordinate art has to consider about wealth. But strictly speaking, as I have already said, the means of life must be provided beforehand by nature, for the business of nature is to furnish food to that which is born, and the food of the offspring is always what remains over of that from which it is produced. Wherefore, the art of getting wealth out of fruits and animals is always natural. There are two sorts of wealth getting, as I have said. One is a part of household management, the other is retail trade the former necessary and honorable, while that which consists in exchange is justly censured, for it is unnatural, and a mode by which men gain from one another. The most hated sort, and with the greatest reason, is usury, which makes a gain out of money itself, and not from the natural object of it. For money was intended to be used in exchange, but not to increase at interest, and this term interest, which means the birth of money from money is applied to the breeding of money because the offspring resembles the parent. Wherefore, of all modes of getting wealth, this is the most unnatural. Section 11 Enough has been said about the theory of wealth getting. We will now proceed to the practical part. The discussion of such matters is not unworthy of philosophy, but to be engaged in them practically is illiberal and irksome. The useful parts of wealth getting are first the knowledge of livestock, which are most profitable and where and how, as, for example, what sort of horses or sheep or oxen or any other animals are most likely to give a return. A man ought to know which of these pay better than others and which pay best in particular places. 
for some do better in one place and some in another. Secondly, husbandry, which may be either tillage or planting, and the keeping of bees and of fish or fowl or of any animals which may be useful to man. These are the divisions of the true or proper art of wealth getting and come first. Of the other, which consists in exchange, the first and most important division is commerce, of which there are three kinds, the provision of a ship, the conveyance of goods, exposure for sale, these again differing as they are safer or more profitable. The second is usury, the third service for hire. Of this, one kind is employed in the mechanical arts, the other in unskilled and bodily labor. There is still a third sort of wealth getting intermediate between this and the first or natural mode, which is partly natural, but is also concerned with exchange. Videla said, the industries that make their profit from the earth and from things growing from the earth, which, although they bear no fruit, are nevertheless profitable. For example, the cutting of timber and all mining. The art of mining, by which minerals are obtained, itself has many branches, for there are various kinds of things dug out of the earth. Of the several divisions of wealth getting I now speak generally. A minute consideration of them might be useful in practice, but it would be tiresome to dwell upon them at greater length now. Those occupations are most truly arts in which there is the least element of chance. They are the meanest in which the body is most deteriorated, the most servile in which there is the greatest use of the body, and the most illiberal in which there is the least need of excellence. Works have been written upon these subjects by various persons. For example, Cares the Perean and Apollodorus the Lemnian, who have treated of tillage and planting, while others have treated of other branches. Anyone who cares for such matters may refer to their writings. It would be well, also, to collect the scattered stories of the ways in which individuals have succeeded in amassing a fortune, for all this is useful to persons who value the art of getting wealth. There is the anecdote of Thales the Milesian and his financial device, which involves a principle of universal application, but is attributed to him on account of his reputation for wisdom. He was reproached for his poverty, which was supposed to show that philosophy was of no use. According to the story, he knew by his skill in the stars, while it was yet winter, that there would be a great harvest of olives in the coming year. So, having a little money, he gave deposits for the use of all the olive presses in Chios and Miletus, which he hired at a low price, because no one bid against him. When the harvest time came, and many were wanted all at once and of a sudden, he let them out at any rate which he pleased, and made a quantity of money. Thus he showed the world that philosophers can easily be rich if they like, but that their ambition is of another sort. He is supposed to have given a striking proof of his wisdom, but, as I was saying, his device for getting wealth is of universal application, and is nothing but the creation of a monopoly. It is an art often practiced by cities when they are want of money. They make a monopoly of provisions. There was a man of Sicily who, having money deposited with him, bought up all the iron from the iron mines. Afterwards, when the merchants came from their various markets to buy, he was the only seller, and without much increasing the price he gained two hundred percent which, when Dionysius heard, he told him that he might take away his money, but that he must not remain at Syracuse, for he thought that the man had discovered a way of making money which was injurious to his own interests. He made the same discovery as Thales. They both contrived to create a monopoly for themselves. And statesmen as well ought to know these things, for a state is often as much in want of money and of such devices for obtaining it as a household, or even more so. Hence, some public men devote themselves entirely to finance. Section 12 Of household management we have seen that there are three parts. One is the rule of a master over slaves, which has been discussed already, another of a father, and the third of a husband. A husband and father, we saw, rules over wife and children, both free, but the rule differs, the rule over his children being a royal, over his wife a constitutional rule. For although there may be exceptions to the order of nature, the male is, by nature, fitter for command than the female, just as the elder and full-grown is superior to the younger and more immature. 
but in most constitutional states the citizens rule and are ruled by turns for the idea of a constitutional state implies that the natures of the citizens are equal and do not differ at all nevertheless when one rules and the other is ruled we endeavor to create a difference of outward forms and names and titles of respect which may be illustrated by the saying of Amasis about his footpan. The relation of the male to the female is of this kind, but there the inequality is permanent. The rule of a father over his children is royal, for he rules by virtue both of love and of the respect due to age, exercising a kind of royal power, and therefore Homer has appropriately called Zeus father of gods and men, because he is the king of all of them. For a king is the natural superior of his subjects, but he should be of the same kin or kind with them, and such is the relation of elder and younger, of father and son. Section 13 Thus it is clear that household management attends more to men than to the acquisition of inanimate things, and to human excellence more than to the excellence of property, which we call wealth and to the virtue of freemen more than to the virtue of slaves. A question may indeed be raised, whether there is any excellence at all in a slave beyond and higher than merely instrumental and ministerial qualities, whether he can have the virtues of temperance, courage, justice, and the like, or whether slaves possess only bodily and ministerial qualities. In whichever way we answer the question, a difficulty arises, for if they have virtue, in what will they differ from freemen? On the other hand, since they are men and share in rational principle, it seems absurd to say that they have no virtue. A similar question may be raised about women and children, whether they too have virtues. Ought a woman to be temperate and brave and just, and is a child to be called temperate and intemperate, or not? So, in general, we may ask about the natural ruler and the natural subject, whether they have the same or different virtues. For if a noble nature is equally required in both, why should one of them always rule and the other always be ruled? Nor can we say that this is a question of degree, for the difference between ruler and subject is a difference of kind, which the difference of more and less never is. Yet how strange is the supposition that the one ought and that the other ought not to have virtue. For if the ruler is intemperate and unjust, how can he rule well? If the subject, how can he obey well? If he be licentious and cowardly, he will certainly not do his duty. It is evident, therefore, that both of them must have a share of virtue, but varying as natural subjects also vary among themselves. Here, the very constitution of the soul has shown us the way. In it one part naturally rules and the other is subject, and the virtue of the ruler we maintain to be different from that of the subject, the one being the virtue of the rational and the other of the irrational part. Now, it is obvious that the same principle applies generally, and therefore almost all things rule and are ruled according to nature, but the kind of rule differs. The free man rules over the slave after another manner from that in which the male rules over the female, or the man over the child. Although the parts of the soul are present in all of them, they are present in different degrees. For the slave has no deliberative faculty at all. The woman has, but it is without authority, and the child has, but it is immature. So, it must necessarily be supposed, to be with the moral virtues also, all should partake of them but only in such manner and degree as is required by each for the fulfillment of his duty. Hence, the ruler ought to have moral virtue in perfection, for his function, taken absolutely, demands a master artificer, and rational principle is such an artificer. The subjects, on the other hand, require only that measure of virtue which is proper to each of them. Clearly, then, moral virtue belongs to all of them, but the temperance of a man and of a woman, or the courage and justice of a man and of a woman, are not, as Socrates maintained, the same. The courage of a man is shown in commanding, of a woman in obeying, and this holds of all other virtues, as will be more clearly seen if we look at them in detail, 
For those who say generally that virtue consists in a good disposition of the soul, or in doing rightly or the like, only deceive themselves. Far better than such definitions is their mode of speaking, who, like Gorgias, enumerate the virtues. All classes must be deemed to have their special attributes. As the poet says of women, silence is a woman's glory. But this is not equally the glory of man. The child is imperfect, and therefore obviously his virtue is not relative to himself alone, but to the perfect man and to his teacher. And in like manner the virtue of the slave is relative to a master. Now, we determine that a slave is useful for the wants of life, and therefore he will obviously require only so much virtue as will prevent him from failing in his duty through cowardice or lack of self-control. Someone will ask whether, if what we are saying is true, virtue will not be required also in the artisans, for they often fail in their work through lack of self-control. But is there not a great difference in the two cases? For the slave shares in his master's life, the artisan is less closely connected with him, and only attains excellence in proportion as he becomes a slave. The meaner sort of mechanic has a special and separate slavery, and whereas the slave exists by nature, not so the shoemaker or other artisan. It is manifest, then, that the master ought to be the source of such excellence in the slave, and not a mere possessor of the art of mastership, which trains the slave in his duties. Wherefore, they are mistaken, who forbid us to converse with slaves, and say that we should employ command only, for slaves stand even more in need of admonition than children. So much for this subject. The relations of husband and wife, parent and child, their several virtues, what in their intercourse with one another is good and what is evil, and how we may pursue the good and escape the evil, will have to be discussed when we speak of the different forms of government. For, inasmuch as every family is a part of the state, and these relationships are the part of a family, and the virtue of the part must have regard to the virtue of the whole, women and children must be trained by education with an eye to the Constitution, if the virtues of either of them are supposed to make any difference in the virtues of the state. And they must make a difference for the children grow up to be citizens, and half the free persons in a state are women. Of these matters enough has been said. Of what remains, let us speak at another time. Regarding, then, our present inquiry is complete, we will make a new beginning. And, first, let us examine the various theories of a perfect state. End of Book 1, Sections 10-13 through 13. Book 2, Sections 1 through to 4 of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lucy Burgoyne. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 2, Sections 1 through to four. Our purpose is to consider what form of political community is best of all for those who are most able to realize their ideal of life. We must therefore examine not only this, but other constitutions, both such as actually exist in well-governed states, and any theoretical forms which are held in esteem that what is good and useful may be brought to light. And let no one suppose that in seeking for something beyond them we are anxious to make a sophistical display at any cost. We only undertake this inquiry because all the constitutions with which we are acquainted are faulty. We will begin with the natural beginning of the subject. Three alternatives are conceivable. The members of a state must either have 1. All things, or 2. Nothing in common, or 3. Some things in common and some not. That they should have nothing in common is clearly impossible, for the Constitution is a community, 
and must at any rate have a common place. One city will be in one place, and the citizens are those who share in that one city. But should a well-ordered state have all things, as far as may be, in common, or some only and not others? For the citizens might conceivably have wives and children and property in common, as Socrates proposes in the Republic of Plato, which is better our present condition or the proposed new order of society. 2. There are many difficulties in the community of women, and the principle on which Socrates rests the necessity of such an institution evidently is not established by his arguments. Further, as a means to the end which he ascribes to the state, the scheme, taken literally, is impracticable, and how we are to interpret it is nowhere precisely stated. I am speaking of the premise from which the argument of Socrates proceeds, that the greater the unity of the state, the better. It is not obvious that a state may at length attain such a degree of unity as to be no longer a state, since the nature of a state is to be a plurality, and in tending to greater unity from being a state, it becomes a family, and from being a family, an individual, for the family may said to be more than the state, and the individual than the family so that we ought not to attain this greatest unity, even if we could, for it would be the destruction of the state. Again, a state is not made up only of so many men, but of different kinds of men, for similars do not constitute a state. It is not like a military alliance. The usefulness of the latter depends upon its quantity even where there is no difference in quality, for mutual protection is the end aimed at. Just as a greater weight of anything is more useful than a less, in like manner a state differs from a nation, when the nation has not its population organized in villages, but lives an Acadian sort of life but the elements out of which a unity is to be formed differ in kind. Wherefore the principle of compensation, as I have already remarked in the ethics, is the salvation of states. Even among freemen and equals this is a principle which must be maintained, for they cannot and rule together, but must change at the end of a year of some other period of time or in some order of succession. The result is that, upon this plan, they all govern, just as if shoemakers and carpenters were to exchange their occupations, and the same persons did not always continue shoemakers and carpenters. And since it is better that this should be so in politics as well, it is clear that while there should be continuance of the same persons in power where this is possible, yet where this is not possible by reason of natural equality of the citizens, and at the same time it is just that and should share in the government, whether to govern be a good thing or a bad. An approximation to this is that equals should in turn retire from office and should apart from official position, be treated alike. Thus the one party rule and the others are ruled in turn, as if they were no longer the same persons. In like manner, when they hold office, there is a variety in the offices held. Hence it is evident that a city is not by nature one, in that sense which some persons affirm and that what is said to be the greatest good of cities is in reality their destruction, but surely the good of things must be that which preserves them. Again, in another point of view, this extreme unification of the state is clearly not good, for a family is more self-sufficing than an individual, and a city than a family, 
and a city only comes into being when the community is large enough to be self-sufficing. If then self-sufficiency is to be desired, the lesser degree of unity is more desirable than the greater. 3. But even supposing that it were best for the community to have the greatest degree of unity, this unity is by no means proved to follow from the fact of all men saying, mine, and not mine, at the same instant of time, which, according to Socrates, is the sign of perfect unity in a state. For the word, all, is ambiguous. If the meaning be that every individual says mine, and not mine, at the same time, then perhaps the result at which Socrates aims may be in some degree accomplished. Each man will call the same person his own son, and the same person his wife, and so of his property and all of that falls to his lot. This, however, is not the way in which people would speak who had had their wives and children in common. They would say, all but not each. In like manner their property would be described as belonging to them, not severely, but collectively. There is an obvious fallacy in the term all, like some other words, both, odd, even. It is ambiguous, and even in abstract argument, becomes a source of logical puzzles. That all persons call the same thing mine, in the sense in which each does so may be a fine thing, but it is impractical, or if the words are taken in the other sense, such a unity in no way conduces to harmony. And there is another objection to the proposal. For that which is common to the greatest numbers has the least care bestowed upon it. Even one thinks chiefly of his own, hardly at all of the common interest, and only when he is himself concerned as an individual. For besides other considerations, everybody is more inclined to neglect the duty which he expects another to fulfil, as in families many attendants are often less useful than a few. Each citizen will have a thousand sons who will not, be his sons individually, but anybody, will be equally the son of anybody, and will therefore be neglected by all alike. Further, upon the principle, every one will use the word mine, of one who is prospering, or the reverse, however small a fraction he may himself be of the whole number. The same boy will be so-and-so's son, the son of each of the thousand, or whatever be the number of the citizens, and even about this he will not be positive, for it is impossible to know who chanced to have a child, or whether, if one came into existence, it has survived. But which is better, for each to say mine in this way, making a man the same relation to two thousand or ten thousand citizens, or to use the word mine in the ordinary and more restricted sense. For usually the same person is called by one man his own son, whom another calls his own brother or cousin or kinsman. Blood relation or connection by marriage, either of himself or of some relation of his, and yet another his clansman or tribesman, and how much better is it to be the real cousin of somebody than to be a son after Plato's fashion. Nor is there any way of preventing brothers and children and fathers and mothers from sometimes recognising one another. For children are born like their parents, and they will necessarily be finding indications of their relationship to one another. Geographers declare such to be the fact. They say that in part of Upper Libya, where the women are common, 
Nevertheless, the children who are born are assigned to their respective fathers on the ground of their likeness. And some women, like the females of other animals, for example, mares and cows, have a strong tendency to produce offspring resembling their parents, as was the case with the Pharsalian mare called Honest. 4. Other evils against which it is not easy for the authors of such a community to guard will be assaults and homicides, voluntary as well as involuntary, quarrels and slanders, all which are most unholy acts when committed against fathers and mothers and near relations, but not equally unholy when there is no relationship. Moreover, they are much more likely to occur if the relationship is unknown, and, when they have occurred, the customary expiations of them cannot be made. Again, how strange it is that Socrates, after having made the children common, should hinder lovers from carnal intercourse only, but should permit love and familiarities between father and son, or between brother and brother, than which nothing can be more unseemly, since even without them love of this sort is improper. How strange, too, to forbid intercourse for no other reason than the violence of the pleasure, as though the relationship of father and son, or of brothers with one another, made no difference. This community of wives and children seem better suited to the husbandmen than to the guardians, for if they have wives and children in common, they will be bound to one another by weaker ties, as a subject class should be, and they will remain obedient and not rebel. In a word, the result of such a law would be just the opposite of which good laws ought to have and the intention of Socrates in making these regulations about women and children would defeat itself. For friendship we believe to be the greatest good of states, and the preservative of them against revolutions. Neither is there anything which Socrates so greatly lords as the unity of the state, which he and all the world declare to be created by friendship but the unity which he commends would be like that of lovers in the symposium, who, as Aristophanes says, desire to grow together in the excess of their affection, and from being two to become one, in which case one or both would certainly perish. Whereas, in a state having women and children common, love will be watery, and the father will certainly not say, My son, or the son, My father. As a little sweet wine mingled with a great deal of water is impeccable in the mixture. So, in this sort of community, the idea of relationship which is based upon these names will be lost. There is no reason why the so-called father should care about the son or the son about the father, or brothers about one another. Of the two qualities which chiefly inspire regard and affection, that a thing is your own, and that it is your only one neither, can exist in such a state as this. Again, the transfer of children as soon as they are born from the rank of husbandmen, or of artisans, to that of guardians, and from the rank of guardians into a lower rank, will be very difficult to arrange. The givers or transferers cannot but know whom they are giving and transferring, and to whom. And the previously mentioned evils, such as assaults, unlawful loves, homicides, will happen more often amongst those who are transferred to the lower classes, or who have a place assigned to them among the guardians, 
for they will no longer call the members of the class they have left brothers, and children, and fathers, and mothers, and will not, therefore, be afraid of committing any crimes by reason of consanguinity. Touching the community of wives and children, let this be our conclusion. End of Book 2, Sections 1 through to 4「Book Two, Sections Five through Six of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Two, Sections Five through Six. Section Five. Next, let us consider what should be our arrangements about property. Should the citizens of the perfect state have their possessions in common or not? This question may be discussed separately from the enactments about women and children, even supposing that the women and children belong to individuals. According to the customs which is at present universal, may there not be an advantage in having and using possessions in common? Three cases are possible. 1. The soil may be appropriated, but the produce may be thrown for consumption into the common stock, and this is the practice of some nations. Or 2. The soil may be common and may be cultivated in common, but the produce divided among individuals for their private use. This is a form of common property which is said to exist among certain barbarians or three, the soil and the produce may be alike common. When the husbandmen are not the owners, the case will be different and easier to deal with, but when they till the ground for themselves, the question of ownership will give a world of trouble. If they do not share equally enjoyments and toils, those who labor much and get little will necessarily complain of those who labor little and receive or consume much. But indeed there is always a difficulty in men living together and having all human relations in common, but especially in their having common property. The partnerships of fellow travelers are an example to the point, for they generally fall out over everyday matters and quarrel about any trifle which turns up. So with servants we are most able to take offense at those with whom we most frequently come into contact in daily life. These are only some of the disadvantages which attend the community of property. The present arrangement, if improved, as it might be by good customs and laws, would be far better, and would have the advantages of both systems. Property should be in a certain sense common, but, as a general rule, private. For when every one has a distinct interest, men will not complain of one another and they will make more progress, because every one will be attending to his own business. And yet by reason of goodness and in respect of use, friends, as the proverb says, will have all things in common. Even now there are traces of such a principle showing that it is not impracticable, but in well-ordered states exist already to a certain extent, and may be carried further. For although every man has his own property, some things he will place at the disposal of his friends, while of others he shares the use with them. The Lacedaemonians, for example, use one another's slaves and horses and dogs, as if they were their own. And when they lack provisions on a journey, they appropriate what they will find in the fields throughout the country. It is clearly better that property should be private, but the use of it common and the special business of the legislator is to create in men this benevolent disposition. Again, how immeasurably greater is the pleasure when a man feels a thing to be his own. For surely the love of self is a feeling implanted by nature and not given in vain, although selfishness is rightly censured. This, however, is not the mere love of self, but the love of self in excess, like the miser's love of money. For all, or almost all, men love money and other such objects in a measure. And further, there is the greatest pleasure in doing a kindness or service to friends or guests or companions, which can only be rendered when a man has private property. 
These advantages are lost by excessive unification of the state. The exhibition of two virtues, besides, is visibly annihilated in such a state. First, temperance towards women, for it is an honorable action to abstain from another's wife for temperance sake. Secondly, liberality in the matter of property. No one, when men have all things in common, will any longer set an example of liberality or do any liberal action, for liberality consists in the use which is made of property. Such legislation may have a specious appearance of benevolence. Men readily listen to it, and are easily induced to believe that in some wonderful manner everybody will become everybody's friend, especially when someone is heard denouncing the evils now existing in states, suits about contracts, convictions for perjury, flatteries of rich men and the like, which are said to arise out of the possession of private property. These evils, however, are due to a very different cause, the wickedness of human nature. Indeed, we see that there is much more quarreling among those who have all things in common, though there are not many of them when compared with the vast numbers who have private property. Again, we ought to reckon not only the evils from which the citizens will be saved, but also the advantages which they will lose. The life which they are to lead appears to be quite impracticable. The error of Socrates must be attributed to the false notion of unity from which he starts. Unity there should be, both of the family and of the state, but in some respects only. For there is a point at which a state may attain such a degree of unity as to be no longer a state, or at which, without actually ceasing to exist, it will become an inferior state, like the harmony passing into unison, or rhythm which has been reduced to a single foot. The state, as I was saying, is a plurality which should be united and made into a community by education, and it is strange that the author of a system of education which he thinks will make the state virtuous should expect to improve his citizens by regulations of this sort and not by philosophy or by customs and laws, like those which prevail at Sparta and Crete respecting common meals, whereby the legislator has made property common. Let us remember that we should not disregard the experience of ages. In the multitude of years these things, if they were good, would certainly not have been unknown, for almost everything has been found out, although sometimes they are not put together. In other cases, men do not use the knowledge which they have. Great light would be thrown on this subject if we could see such a form of government in the actual process of construction. For the legislator could not form a state at all without distributing and dividing its constituents into associations for common meals, and into fratries and tribes. But all this legislation ends only in forbidding agriculture to the guardians a prohibition which the Lacedaemonians try to enforce already. But indeed Socrates has not said, nor is it easy to decide, what in such a community will be the general form of the state. The citizens who are not guardians are the majority, and about them nothing has been determined. Are the husbandmen too to have their property in common, or is each individual to have his own, and are the wives and children to be individual or common? If, like the guardians, they are to have all things in common, what do they differ from them, or what will they gain by submitting to their government? Or upon what principle would they submit, unless indeed the governing class adopt the ingenious policy of the Cretans, who give their slaves the same institutions as their own, but forbid them gymnastic exercises and the possession of arms? If, on the other hand, the inferior classes are to be like other cities in respect of marriage and property, what will be the form of the community? Must it not contain two states in one, each hostile to the other he makes the guardians into a mere occupying garrison, while the husbandmen and artisans and the rest are the real citizens? But if so, the suits and quarrels, and all the evils which Socrates affirms to exist in other states, will exist equally among them. He says, indeed, that, having so good an education, the citizens will not need many laws. For example, laws about the city or about the markets. But then he confines his education to the guardians. Again, he makes the husbandmen owners of the property, 
upon condition of their paying a tribute. But in that case they are likely to be more unmanageable and conceited than the helots or peniste or slaves in general, and whether community of wives and property be necessary for the lower equally with the higher class or not, and the questions akin to this, what will be the education, form of government, laws of the lower class, Socrates has nowhere determined. Neither is it easy to discover this, nor is their character of small importance if the common life of the guardians is to be maintained. Again, if Socrates makes the women common, and retains private property, the men will see to the fields, but who will see to the house? And who will do so if the agricultural class have both their property and their wives in common? Once more it is absurd to argue, from the analogy of the animals, that men and women should follow the same pursuits, for animals have not to manage a household. The government, too, as constituted by Socrates, contains elements of danger, for he makes the same persons always rule. And if this is often a case of disturbance among the meaner sort, how much more among high-spirited warriors! But that the persons whom he makes rulers must be the same is evident, for the gold which the god mingles in the souls of men is not at one time given to one, at another time to another, but always to the same. As he says, God mingles gold in some, and silver in others, from their very birth. But brass and iron in those who are meant to be artisans and husbandmen. Again he deprives the guardians even of happiness, and says that the legislator ought to make the whole state happy. But the whole cannot be happy unless most or all, or some of its parts, enjoy happiness. In this respect happiness is not like the even principle in numbers which may exist only in the whole, but in neither of the parts. Not so happiness. And if the guardians are not happy, who are? Surely not the artisans or the common people. The republic of which Socrates discourses has all these difficulties, and others quite as great. Section 6 The same or nearly the same objections apply to Plato's later work, The Laws, and therefore we had better examine briefly the constitution which is therein described. In the Republic, Socrates has definitely settled in all a few questions only, such as the community of women and children, the community of property, and the constitution of the state. The population is divided into two classes, one of husbandmen and the other of warriors. From this latter is taken a third class of counselors and rulers of the state. But Socrates has not determined whether the husbandmen and artisans are to have a share in the government, and whether they too are to carry arms and share in military service or not. He certainly thinks that the women ought to share in the education of the guardians and to fight by their side. The remainder of the work is filled up with digressions foreign to the main subject and with discussions about the education of the guardians. In the laws there is hardly anything but laws but much is said about the Constitution. This, which he had intended to make more of the ordinary type, he gradually brings round to the other or ideal form. For with the exception of the community of women and property, he supposes everything to be the same in both states. There is to be the same education. The citizens of both are to live free from servile occupations, and there are to be common meals in both. The only difference is that in the laws the common meals are extended to women, and the warriors number five thousand, but in the republic only one thousand. The discourses of Socrates are never commonplace. They always exhibit grace and originality and thought, but perfection in everything can hardly be expected. We must not overlook the fact that the number of five thousand citizens just now mentioned will require a territory as large as Babylon, or some other huge site, if so many persons are to be supported in idleness, together with their women and attendants, who will be a multitude many times as great. In framing an ideal we may assume what we wish, but should avoid impossibilities. It is said that the legislator ought to have his eyes directed to two points, the people and the country. But neighboring countries also must not be forgotten by him, 
firstly because the state for which he legislates is to have a political and not an isolated life. For a state must have such a military force as will be serviceable against her neighbors, and not merely useful at home. Even if the life of action is not admitted to be the best, either for individuals or states, still a city should be formidable to enemies, whether invading or retreating. There is another point. Should not the amount of property be defined in some way which differs from this by being clearer? For Socrates says that a man should have so much property as will enable him to live temperately, which is only a way of saying to live well. This is too general a conception. Further, a man may live temperately and yet miserably. A better definition would be that a man must have so much property as will enable him to live not only temperately, but liberally. If the two are parted, liberally will combine with luxury. Temperance will be associated with toil. For liberality and temperance are the only eligible qualities which have to do with the use of property. A man cannot use property with mildness or courage, but temperately and liberally he may, and therefore the practice of these virtues is inseparable from property. There is an inconsistency, too, in equalizing the property and not regulating the number of the citizens. The population is to remain unlimited, and he thinks that it will be sufficiently equalized by a certain number of marriages being unfruitful. However, many are born to others, because he finds this to be the case in existing states. But greater care will be required than now, for among ourselves, whatever may be the number of citizens, the property is always distributed among them, and therefore no one is in want. But if the property were incapable of division, as in the laws, the supernumeraries, whether few or many, would get nothing. One would have thought that it was even more necessary to limit population than property, and that the limit should be fixed by calculating the chances of mortality in the children, and of the sterility in married persons. The neglect of this subject, which in existing states is so common, is a never-failing cause of poverty among the citizens, and poverty is the parent of revolution and crime. Phidon, the Corinthian, who was one of the most ardent legislators, thought that the families and the number of citizens ought to remain the same, although originally all the lots may have been of different sizes. But in the laws the opposite principle is maintained. What, in our opinion, is the right arrangement will have to be explained hereafter. There is another omission in the laws. Socrates does not tell us how the rulers differ from their subjects. He only says that they should be related as the warp and the wolf, which are made out of different wools. He allows that a man's whole property may be increased fivefold, but why should not his land also increase to a certain extent? Again, will the good management of a household be promoted by his arrangement of homesteads? For he assigns to each individual two homesteads in separate places, and it is difficult to live in two houses. The whole system of government tends to be neither democracy nor oligarchy, but something in a mean between them, which is usually called a polity, and is composed of the heavy-armed soldiers. Now, if he intended to frame a constitution which would suit the greatest number of states, he was very likely right, but not if he meant to say that this constitutional form came nearest to his first or ideal state, for many would prefer the Lacedaemonian or possibly some other more aristocratic government. Some indeed say that the best constitution is a combination of all existing forms, and they praise the Lacedaemonian because it is made up of oligarchy, monarchy, and democracy, the king forming the monarchy, and the council of elders the oligarchy, while the democratic element is represented by the ephors, for the ephors are selected from the people. Others, however, declare that ephorality to be a tyranny, and find the element of democracy in the common meals and in the habits of daily life. In the laws it is maintained that the best constitution is made up of democracy and tyranny, which are either not constitutions at all, or are the worst of all. But they are nearer the truth who combine many forms. For the constitution is better which is made up of more numerous elements, 
the constitution proposed in the laws has no element of monarchy at all it is nothing but oligarchy and democracy leaning rather to oligarchy this is seen in the mode of appointing magistrates for although the appointment of them by lot from among those who have been already selected combines both elements the way in which the rich are compelled by law to attend the assembly and vote for magistrates or discharge other political duties while the rest may do as they like and the endeavor to have the greater number of the magistrates appointed out of the richer classes and the highest officers selected from those who have the greatest incomes both these are oligarchical features the oligarchical principle prevails also in the choice of the council for all are compelled to choose but the compulsion extends only to the choice out of the first class and of an equal number out of the second class and out of the third class but not in this latter case to all the voters but to those of the first three classes and the selection of candidates out of the fourth class is only compulsory on the first and second then from the person so chosen he says that there ought to be an equal number of each class selected thus a preponderance will be given to the better sort of people who have the larger incomes because many of the lower classes not being compelled will not vote these considerations and others which will be adduced when the time comes for examining similar polities tend to show that states like plato's should not be composed of democracy and monarchy there is also a danger in electing the magistrates out of the body who are themselves elected for if but a few small number choose to combine the elections will always go as they desire such is the constitution which is described in the laws end of book two sections five and six book two section seven through eight of politics by aristotle this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 2. Section 7 through 8. Section 7. Other constitutions have been proposed, some by private persons, others by philosophers and statesmen, which all come nearer to established or existing ones than either of Plato's. No one else has introduced such novelties as the community of women and children, or public tables for women. Other legislators begin with what is necessary. In the opinion of some, the regulation of property is the chief point of all, that being the question upon which all revolutions turn. This danger was recognized by Phaleas of Chalcedon, who was the first to affirm that the citizens of a state ought to have equal possessions. He thought that in a new colony the equalization might be accomplished without difficulty, not so easily when a state was already established, and that the shortest way of compassing the desired end would be for the rich to give and not to receive marriage portions, and for the poor not to give but to receive them. Plato, in the laws, was of the opinion that, to a certain extent, accumulation should be allowed, forbidding, as I have already observed, any citizen to possess more than five times the minimum qualification, but those who make such laws should remember what they are apt to forget, that the legislator who fixes the amount of property should also fix the number of children, for if the children are too many for the property, the law must be broken and, besides the violation of the law, it is a bad thing that many from being rich should become poor, for men of ruined fortunes are sure to stir up revolutions. That the equalization of property exercises an influence on political society was clearly understood, even by some of the old legislators. Laws were made by Salon and others prohibiting an individual from possessing as much land as he pleased, and there are other laws in the states which forbid the sale of property. Among the Locrians, for example, there is a law that a man is not to sell his property unless he can prove unmistakably that some misfortune has befallen him. Again, there have been laws which enjoin the preservation of the original lots. Such a law existed in the island of Lucas, 
and the abrogation of it made the Constitution too democratic, for the rulers no longer had the prescribed qualifications. Again, where there is equality of property, the amount may be either too large or too small, and the possessor may be living either in luxury or penury. Clearly, then, the legislator ought not only to aim at the equalization of properties, but at moderation in their amount. Further, if he prescribe this moderate amount equally to all, he will be no nearer the mark. For it is not the possessions, but the desires of mankind which require to be equalized, and this is impossible unless a sufficient education is provided by the laws. But Phaleas will probably reply that this is precisely what he means, and that in his opinion there ought to be in states not only equal property, but equal education. Still he should tell precisely what he means, and that in his opinion there ought to be, in having one and the same for all, if it is of a sort that predisposes men to avarice, or ambition, or both. Moreover, civil troubles arise, not only out of the inequality of property, but out of the inequality of honor, though in opposite ways. For the common people quarrel about the inequality of property, the higher classes about the equality of honor. As the poet says, the bad and good alike in honor share. There are crimes of which the motive is want, and for these Phaleus expects to find a cure in the equalization of property, which will take away from a man the temptation to be a highwayman, because he is hungry or cold. But want is not the sole incentive to crime. Men also wish to enjoy themselves and not to be in a state of desire. They wish to cure some desire going beyond the necessities of life, which prey upon them. Nay, this is not the only reason. They may desire superfluities in order to enjoy pleasures unaccompanied with pain, and therefore they commit crimes. Now what is the cure of these three disorders? Of the first, moderate possessions and occupation. Of the second, habits of temperance. As to the third, if any desire pleasures which depend on themselves, they will find the satisfaction of their desires nowhere but in philosophy. For all other pleasures we are dependent on others. The fact is that the greatest crimes are caused by excess, and not by necessity. Men do not become tyrants in order that they may not suffer cold, and hence great is the honor bestowed, not on him who kills a thief, but on him who kills a tyrant. Thus we see that the institutions of Phaleus avail only against petty crimes. There is another objection to them. They are chiefly designed to promote the internal welfare of the state. But the legislator should consider also its relation to neighboring nations, and to all who are outside of it. The government must be organized with a view to military strength, and of this he has said not a word. And so with respect to property— there should not only be enough to supply the internal wants of the state, but also to meet dangers coming from without. The property of the state should not be so large that more powerful neighbors may be tempted by it, while the owners are unable to repel the invaders, nor yet so small that the state is unable to maintain a war against states of equal power and of the same character. Phaleas has not laid down any rule, but we should bear in mind that abundance of wealth is an advantage. The best limit will probably be that a more powerful neighbor must be to inducement to go to war with you by reason of the excess of your wealth, but only such as he would have had if you had possessed less. There is a story that Eubulus, when Autophrodates was going to besiege Atarnius, told him to consider how long the operation would take, and then reckon upon the cost which would be incurred in the time. For, he said, I am willing for a smaller sum than that to leave Atarnius at once. These words of Eubulus made an impression on Autophrodates as he desisted from the siege. The equalization of property is one of the things that tend to prevent the citizens from quarreling. Not that the gain in this direction is very great, for the nobles will be dissatisfied because they think themselves worthy of more than an equal share of honors, and this is often found to be a cause of sedition and revolution, and the avarice of mankind is insatiable. At one time two obols was pay enough, but now, when the sum has become customary, men always want more and more without end. For it is of the nature of desire not to be satisfied, and most men live only for the gratification of it. 
The beginning of reform is not so much to equalize property as to train the nobler sort of natures not to desire more, and to prevent the lower from getting more. That is to say, they must be kept down, but not ill-treated. Besides, the equalization proposed by Phaleus is imperfect, for he only equalizes land, whereas a man may be rich also in slaves and cattle and money, and in the abundance of what are called his movables. Now either all these things must be equalized, or some limit must be imposed on them, or they must be let alone. It would appear that Phaleus is legislating for a small city only, if, as he supposes, all the artisans are to be public slaves, and not to form a supplementary part of the body of citizens. But if there is a law that artisans are to be public slaves, it should only apply to those engaged in public works, as at Epidamnus, or at Athens on the plan which Diophantus once introduced. From these observations any one may judge how far Phaleus was wrong or right in his ideas. Section 8 Hippodamnus, the son of Euryphon, a native of Miletus, the same who invented the art of planting cities, and who also laid out the Piraeus, a strange man whose fondness for distinction led him into a general eccentricity of life, which made some think him affected, for he would wear flowing hair and expensive ornaments, but these were worn on a cheap but warm garment both in winter and summer. He, besides aspiring to be adept in the knowledge of nature, was the first person, not a statesman, who made inquiries about the best form of government. The city of Hippodamus was composed of ten thousand citizens divided into three parts, one of artisans, one of husbandmen, and a third of armed defenders of the state. He also divided the land into three parts, one sacred, one public, the third private. The first was set apart to maintain the customary worship of the gods, the second was to support the warriors. The third was the property of the husbandman. He also divided laws into three classes, and no more, for he maintained that there are three subjects of lawsuits, insult, injury, and homicide. He likewise instituted a single final court of appeal, to which all cases seeming to have been improperly decided might be referred. This court he formed of elders chosen for the purpose. He was further of opinion that the decisions of the court ought not to be given by the use of a voting pebble, but that every one should have a tablet on which he might not only write a simple condemnation, or leave the tablet blank for a simple acquittal, but if he partly acquitted and partly condemned, he was to distinguish accordingly. To the existing law he objected that it obliged the judges to be guilty of perjury, whichever way they voted. He also enacted that those who discovered anything for the good of the state should be honored, and he provided that the children of citizens who died in battle should be maintained at the public expense, as if such an enactment had never been heard of before. Yet it actually exists at Athens and in other places. As to the magistrates, he would have them all elected by the people, that is, by the three classes already mentioned and those who were elected were to watch over the interest of the public, of strangers, and of orphans. These are the most striking points in the constitution of Hippodamus. There is not much else. The first of these proposals to which objection may be taken is the threefold division of the citizens. The artisans and the husbandmen and the warriors all have a share in the government, but the husbandmen have no arms, and the artisans neither arms nor land and therefore they become all but slaves of the warrior class. That they should share in all the offices is an impossibility. For generals and guardians of the citizens, and nearly all the principal magistrates, must be taken from the classes of those who carry arms. Yet, if the two other classes have no share in the government, how can they be loyal citizens? It may be said that those who have arms must necessarily be masters of both the other classes, but this is not so easily accomplished unless they are numerous, and if they are, why should the other classes share in the government at all, or have power to appoint magistrates? Further, what use are farmers to the city? Artisans there must be, for these are wanted in every city, and they can live by their craft, as elsewhere, and the husbandmen too, if they really provided the warriors with food, might fairly have a share in the government but in the Republic of Hippodamus they are supposed to have land of their own, which they cultivate for their private benefit. 
again as to this common land out of which the soldiers are maintained if they are themselves to be the cultivators of it the warrior class will be identical with the husbandman although the legislator intended to make a distinction between them if again there are to be other cultivators distinct both from the husbandmen who have land of their own and from the warriors they will make a fourth class which has no place in the state and no share in anything or if the same persons are to cultivate their own lands and those of the public as well they will have difficulty in supplying the quantity of produce which will maintain two households and why in this case should there be any division for they might find food themselves and give to the warriors from the same land and the same lots there is surely a great confusion in all of this neither is the law to be commended which says that the judges when a simple issue is laid before them should distinguish in their judgment now in an arbitration although the arbitrators are many they confer with one another about the decision and therefore they can distinguish but in courts of law this is impossible and indeed most legislators take pains to prevent the judges from holding any communication with one another again will there not be confusion if the judges think that damages should be given but not so much as the suitor demands he asks say for twenty minae and the judge allows him ten minae or in general the suitor asks for more and the judge allows less while another judge allows five another four minae in this way they will go on splitting up the damage and some will grant the whole and others nothing how is this final reckoning to be taken again no one contends that he who votes for a simple acquittal or condemnation perjures himself if the indictment has been laid in an unqualified form and this is just for the judge who acquits does not decide that the defendant owes nothing but that he does not owe the twenty minae he only is guilty of perjury who thinks that the defendant ought not to pay twenty minae and yet condemns him to honor those who discover anything which is useful to the state is a proposal which has a specious sound but cannot safely be enacted by law for it may encourage informers and perhaps even lead to political commotions this question involves another it has been doubted whether it is or is not expedient to make any changes in the laws of a country even if another law be better now if changes are inexpedient we can hardly assent to the proposal of hippodamus for under pretense of doing a public service a man may introduce measures which are really destructive to the laws or to the constitution but since we have touched upon this subject perhaps we had better go a little into detail for as i was saying there is a difference of opinion and it may sometimes seem desirable to make changes such changes in the other arts and scientists have certainly been beneficial medicine for example and gymnastic and every other art and craft have departed from the traditional usage and if politics be an art change must be necessary in this as in any other art that improvement has occurred is shown by the fact that old customs are exceedingly simple and barbarous for the ancient hellenes went about armed and bought their brides for each other the remains of ancient laws which have come down to us are quite absurd for example in cumi there is a law about murder to the effect that if the accuser produce a certain number of witnesses from among his own kinsmen the accused shall be held guilty again men in general desire the good but not merely what their fathers had but the primeval inhabitants whether they were born of the earth or were the survivors of some destruction may be supposed to have been no better than ordinary or even foolish people among ourselves such is certainly the tradition concerning the earth-born men and it would be ridiculous to rest contented with their notions even when laws have been written down they ought not always to remain unaltered as in other sciences so in politics it is impossible that all things should be precisely set down in writing for enactments must be universal but actions are concerned with particulars hence we infer that sometimes and in certain cases laws may be changed but when we look at the matter from another point of view great caution would seem to be required for the habit of lightly changing the laws is an evil and when the advantage is small some errors both of lawgivers and rulers had better be left the citizen will not gain so much by making the change as he will lose by the habit of disobedience the analogy of the arts is false 
A change in a law is a very different thing from a change in an art. For the law has no power to command obedience except that of habit, which can only be given by time, so that a readiness to change from old to new laws enfeebles the power of the law. Even if we admit that the laws are to be changed, are they all to be changed, and in every state? And are they to be changed by anybody who likes, or only by certain persons? These are very important questions, and therefore we had better reserve the discussion of them to a more suitable occasion. End of Book 2, Section 7 through 8「Book Two, Sections Nine and Ten of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Two, Sections Nine and Ten. Section Nine. In the governments of Lacedaemon and Crete, and indeed in all governments, two points have to be considered. First, whether any particular law is good or bad when compared with the perfect state. Secondly, whether it is or is not consistent with the idea and character which the lawgiver has set before his citizens. That in a well-ordered state the citizens should have leisure and not have to provide for their daily wants is generally acknowledged but there is a difficulty in seeing how this leisure is to be attained. The Thessalian Penistae have often risen against their masters, and the Helots in like manner against the Lacedaemonians, for whose misfortunes they are always lying in wait. Nothing, however, of this kind has yet happened to the Cretans. The reason probably is that the neighboring cities, even when at war with one another, never form an alliance with rebellious serfs, rebellions not being for their interest, since they themselves have a dependent population. Whereas all the neighbors of the Lacedaemonians, whether Argives, Mycenaeans, or Arcadians, were their enemies. In Thessaly, again, the original revolt of the slaves occurred because the Thessalians were still at work with the neighboring Achaeans, Perhabians, and Magnesians. Besides, if there were no other difficulty, the treatment or management of slaves is a troublesome affair, for, if not kept in hand, they are insolent and think they are as good as their masters, and, if harshly treated, they hate and conspire against them. Now it is clear that when these are the results, the citizens of a state have not found out the secret of managing their subject population. Again, the license of the Macedonian women defeats the intention of the Spartan constitution and is adverse to the happiness of the state. For a husband and wife being each a part of every family, the state may be considered as about equally divided into men and women, and therefore in those states in which the condition of the women is bad, half the city may be regarded as having no law. And this is what has actually happened at Sparta. The legislator wanted to make the whole state hardy and temperate, and he has carried out his intention in this case of men, but he has neglected the women who live in every sort of intemperance and luxury. The consequence is that in such a state wealth is too highly valued, especially if the citizen fall under the dominion of their wives, after the manner of most warlike races, except the Celts and a few others who, have, who openly approve of male loves. The old mythologer would seem to have been right in uniting Ares and Aphrodite, for all warlike races are prone to love either of men or of women. This was exemplified among the Spartans in the days of their greatness. Many things were managed by their women, but what difference does it make whether women rule or the rulers are ruled by women? The result is the same. Even in regard to courage, which is of no use in daily life and is needed only in war, the influence of the Lacedaemonian women has been most mischievous. The evil showed itself in the Theban invasion when, unlike the women of other cities, they were utterly useless and caused more confusion than the enemy. This license of the Lacedaemonian women existed from the earliest times and was only what might be expected. For during the wars of the Lacedaemonians, first against the Argives and afterwards against the Arcadians and Messenians, the men were long away from home and, on the return of peace, they gave themselves into the legislator's hand, 
already prepared by the discipline of a soldier's life in which there are many elements of virtue to receive his enactments but when lycurgus as tradition says wanted to bring the women under his laws they resisted and he gave up the attempt these then are the causes of what then happened and this defect in the constitution is clearly to be attributed to them we are not however considering what is or is not to be excused but what is right or wrong and the disorder of the women as i have already said not only gives an air of indecorum to the constitution considered in itself but tends in a measure to foster avarice the mention of avarice naturally suggests a criticism on the inequality of property while some of the spartan citizens have quite small properties others have very large ones hence the land has passed into the hands of a few and this is due also to faulty laws for although the legislator rightly holds up to shame the sale or purchase of an inheritance he allows anybody who likes to give or bequeath it yet both practices lead to the same result and nearly two-fifths of the whole country are held by women this is owing to the number of heiresses and to the large dowries which are customary it would surely have been better to have given no dowries at all or if any but small and or moderate ones as the law now stands a man may bestow his heiress on any one whom he pleases and if he die intestate the privilege of giving her away descends to his heir hence although the country is able to maintain fifteen hundred cavalry and thirty thousand hoplites the whole number of spartan citizens fell below one thousand the result proves the faulty nature of their laws respecting property for the city sank under a single defeat the want of men was their ruin there is a tradition that in the days of their ancient kings they were in the habit of giving the rights of citizenship to strangers and therefore in spite of their long wars no lack of population was experienced by them indeed at one time sparta is said to have numbered not less than ten thousand citizens whether this statement is true or not it would certainly have been better to have maintained their numbers by the equalization of property again the law which relates to the procreation of children is adverse to the correction of this inequality for the legislator wanting to have as many spartans as he could encouraged the citizens to have large families and there is a law at sparta that the father of three sons shall be exempt from military service and he who has four from all the burdens of, of the state yet it is obvious that if there were many children the land being distributed as it is many of them must necessarily fall into poverty the lacedaemonian constitution is defective in another point i mean the ephoralty this magistracy has authority in the highest matters but the ephors are chosen from the whole people and so the office is apt to fall into the hands of very poor men who being badly off are open to bribes there have been many examples at sparta of this evil in former times and quite recently in the matter of the andrians certain of the ephors who were bribed did their best to ruin the state and so great and tyrannical is their power that even the kings have been compelled to court them so that in this way as well together with the royal office the whole constitution has deteriorated and from being an aristocracy has turned into a democracy the ephoralty certainly does keep the state together for the people are contented when they have a share in the highest office and the result whether due to the legislator or to chance has been advantageous for if a constitution is to be permanent all the parts of the state must wish that it should exist and the same arrangements be maintained this is the case at sparta where the kings desire its permanence because they have due honor in their own persons the nobles because they are represented in the council of elders for the office of elder is a reward of virtue and the people because all are eligible to the ephoralty the election of ephors out of the whole people is perfectly right but ought not to be carried on in the pe present fashion which is too childish again they have the decision of great causes although they are quite ordinary men and therefore they should not determine them merely on their own judgment but according to written rules and to the laws their way of life too is not in accordance with the spirit of the constitution they have a deal too much license whereas in the case of the other citizens the excess of strictness is so intolerable that they run away from the law into the secret indulgence of sensual pleasures again the council of elders is not free from defects it may be said that the elders are good men and well trained in manly virtue and that therefore there is an advantage to the state in having them 
but that judges of important causes should hold office for life is a disputable thing for the mind grows old as well as the body and when men have been educated in such a manner that even the legislator himself cannot trust them there is real danger many of the elders are well known to have taken bribes and to have been guilty of partiality in public affairs and therefore they ought not to be irresponsible yet at sparta they are so but it may be replied all magistracies are accountable to the ephors yes but this prerogative is too great for them and we maintain that the control should be exercised in some other manner further the mode in which the spartans elect their elders is childish and it is improper that the person to be elected should canvass for the office the worthiest should be appointed whether he chooses or not and here the legislator clearly indicates the same intention which appears in other parts of his constitution he would have his citizens ambitious and he has reckoned upon his, this ability in the election of the elders for no one would ask to be elected if he were not yet ambition and avarice almost more than any other passions are the motives of crime whether kings are or are not an advantage to states i will consider at another time they should at any rate be chosen not as they are now but with regard to their personal life and conduct the legislator himself obviously did not suppose that he could make them really good men at least he shows a great distrust of their virtue for this reason the spartans used to join enemies with them in the same embassy and the quarrels between the kings were held to be conservative of the state neither did the first introducer of the common meals called fidicia regulate them well the entertainment ought to have been provided at the public cost as in crete but among the lacedaemonians every one is expected to contribute and some of them are too poor to afford the expense thus the intention of the legislator is frustrated the common meals were meant to be a popular institution but the existing manner of it regulating them is the reverse of popular for the very poor can scarcely take part in them and according to ancient custom those who cannot contribute are not allowed to retain the rights of citizenship the law about the spartan admirals has often been censored and with justice it is a source of dissension for the kings are perpetual generals and this office of admiral is but the setting up of another king the charge which plato brings in the laws against the intention of the legislator is likewise justified the whole constitution has regard to one part of virtue only the virtue of the soldier which gives victory in war so long as they were at war therefore their power was preserved but when they had attained empire they fell for of the arts of peace they knew nothing and had never engaged in any employment higher than war there is another error equally great into which they have fallen although they truly think that the goods for which men contend are to be acquired by virtue rather than by vice they err in supposing that these goods are to be preferred to the virtue which gains them once more the revenues of the state are ill-managed there is no money in the treasury although they are obliged to carry on great wars and they are unwilling to pay taxes the greater part of the land being in the hands of the spartans they do not look closely into one another's contributions the result which the legislator has produced is the reverse of beneficial for he has made his city poor and his citizens greedy enough respecting the spartan constitution of which these are the principal defects end of section nine Book two, sections nine and ten of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book two, sections nine and ten. Section ten. the cretan constitution nearly resembles the spartan and in some few points is quite as good but for the most part less perfect in form the older constitutions are generally less elaborate than the later and the lacedaemonian is said to be and probably is in a very great measure a copy of the cretan according to tradition lycurgus when he ceased to be the guardian of king charles 
went abroad and spent most of his time in Crete, for the two countries are nearly connected. The Lycians are a colony of Lacedaemonians, and the colonists, when they came to Crete, adopted the constitution which they found existing among the inhabitants. Even to this day the Periisse, or subject population of Crete, are governed by the original laws which Minos is supposed to have enacted. The island seems to be intended by nature for dominion in Hellas, and to be well situated. It extends right across the sea, around which nearly all the Hellens are settled and while one end is not far the, from the Peloponnese, the other almost reaches to the region of Asia, about Triopium and Rhodes. Hence Minos acquired the empire of the sea, subduing some of the islands and colonizing others. At last he invaded Sicily, where he died near Camachus. The Cretan institutions resemble the Lacedaemonian, the Helots are the husbandmen of the one, the Periisse of the other, and both Cretans and Lacedaemonians have common meals, which were anciently called by the Lacedaemonians not Phoenicia, but Andria, and the Cretans have the same word, the use of which proves that the common meals originally came from Crete. Further, the two constitutions are similar, for the office of the Ephors is the same as that of the Cretan Cosme, the only difference being that whereas the Ephors are five, the Cosme are ten in number. The elders, too, answer to the elders in Crete, who are termed by the Cretans the Council. The kingly office once existed in Crete, but was abolished, and the Cosme have now the duty of leading them in war. All classes share in the Ecclesia, but it can only ratify the decrees of the elders and, uh, and the Cosme. The common meals of Crete are certainly better managed than the Lacedaemonian, for in Lacedaemonia everyone pays so much per head, or, if he fails, the law, as I have already explained, forbids him to exercise the rights of citizenship. But in Crete they are of a f more popular character. There, of all the fruits of the earth and cattle raised on public lands, and of the tribute which is paid by the Periisse, one portion is assigned to the gods and to the service of the state, and another to the common meals, so that men, women, and children are all supported out of a common stock. The legislator has many ingenious ways of securing moderation in eating, which he conceives to be a gain. He likewise encourages the separation of men from women, lest they should have too many children, and the companionship of men with one another. Whether this is a good or bad thing, I shall have an opportunity of considering at another time. But that the Cretan common meals are better ordered than the Lacedaemonian, there can be no doubt. On the other hand, the Cosme are even a worse institution than the Ephors, of which they have all the evils without the good. Like the Ephors, they are any chance persons, but in Crete this is not counterbalanced by a corresponding political advantage. At Sparta everyone is eligible, and the body of the people, having a share in the highest office, want the constitution to be permanent. But in Crete the Cosme are elected out of certain families, and not out of the whole people, and the elders out of those who have been Cosme. The same criticism may be made about the Cretan, which has been already made about the Lacedaemonian elders. Their irresponsibility and life tenure is too great a privilege, and their arbitrary power of acting upon their own judgment and dispensing with written law is dangerous. It is no proof of the goodness of the institution that the people are not discontented at it being excluded from it, for there is no profit to be made out of the office as out of the efferalty, since, unlike the efforts, the Cosme, being in an island, are removed from temptation. The remedy by which they correct the evil of this institution is an extraordinary one, suited rather to a close oligarchy than to a constitutional state. For the Cosme are often expelled by a conspiracy of their own colleagues, or of private individuals, and they are allowed also to resign before their term of office has expired. Surely all matters of this kind are better regulated by law than by the will of man, which is a very unsafe rule. Worst of all is the suspension of the office of Cosme, a device to which the nobles often have recourse when they will not submit to justice. This shows that the Cretan government, although possessing some of the characteristics of a constitutional state, is really a close oligarchy. The nobles have a habit, too, of setting up a chief. They get together a party among the common people and their own friends, and then quarrel and fight with one another. 
what is this but the temporary destruction of the state and dissolution of society a city is in a dangerous condition when those who are willing are also able to attack her but as i have already said the island of crete is saved by her situation distance has the same effect as the less demanian prohibition of strangers and the cretans have no foreign dominions this is the reason why the Periisi are contented in crete whereas the helots are perpetually revolting but when lately foreign invaders found their way into the island the weakness of the cretan constitution was revealed enough of the government of crete End of section ten. End of book two, sections nine and ten. Recording by Jennifer Hilo, Hawaii. Book two, sections eleven and twelve of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 2, sections 11 and 12. The Carthaginians are also considered to have an excellent form of government, which differs from that of any other state in several respects though it is in some very like the Lacedaemonian. Indeed, all three states, the Lacedaemonian, the Cretan, and the Carthaginian, nearly resemble one another and are very different from any others. Many of the Carthaginian institutions are excellent. The superiority of their constitution is proved by the fact that the common people remain loyal to the constitution. The Carthaginians have never had any rebellion worth speaking of, and have never been under the rule of a tyrant. Among the points in which the Carthaginian constitution resembles the Lacedaemonian are the following. The common tables of the clubs answer to the Spartan Phidicia and their magistracy of the 104 to the Ephors. But whereas the Ephors are any chance persons, the magistrates of the Carthaginians are elected according to merit. This is an improvement. They have also their kings and their Jerusia, or council of elders who correspond to the kings and elders of Sparta. Their kings, unlike the Spartan, are not always of the same family, nor that an ordinary one, but if there is some distinguished family they are selected out of it and not appointed by seniority. This is far better. Such officers have great power, and therefore, if they are persons of little worth, do a great deal of harm, and they have already done harm at Lacedaemon. Most of the defects or deviations from the perfect state, for which the Carthaginian constitution would be censored, apply equally to all the forms of government which we have mentioned. But of the deflections from aristocracy and constitutional government, some incline more to democracy and some to oligarchy. The kings and elders, if unanimous, may determine whether they will or will not bring a matter before the people, but when they are not unanimous, the people decide on such matters as well. And whatever the kings and elders bring before the people is not only heard, but also determined by them, and any one who likes may oppose it. Now this is not permitted in Sparta and Crete. That the magistrates of five, who have under them many important matters, should be co-opted, that they should choose the Supreme Council of one hundred, and should hold office longer than other magistrates, for they are virtually rulers both before and after they hold office, these are oligarchical features, their being without salary and not elected by lot, and any similar points such as the practice of having all suits tried by the magistrates, and not some by one class of judges or jurors, and some by another as at Lacedaemon, are characteristic of aristocracy. The Carthaginian constitution deviates from aristocracy and inclines to oligarchy, chiefly on a point where popular opinion is on their side. For men in general think that magistrates should be chosen not only for their merit, but for their wealth. A man, they say, who is poor cannot rule well, he has not the leisure. If, then, elections of magistrates for the wealth be characteristic of oligarchy, and election for merit of aristocracy, there will be a third form under which the constitution of Carthage is comprehended. 
for the Carthaginians choose their magistrates, and particularly the highest of them, their kings and generals, with an eye both to merit and to wealth. But we must acknowledge that, in thus deviating from aristocracy, the legislator has committed an error. Nothing is more absolutely necessary than to provide that the highest class, not only when in office, but when out of office, should have leisure and not disgrace themselves in any way, and to this his attention should be first directed. Even if you must have regard to wealth, in order to secure leisure, yet it is surely a bad thing that the greatest offices, such as those of kings and generals, should be bought. The law which allows this abuse makes wealth of more account than virtue and the whole state becomes avaricious. For, whenever the chiefs of the state deem anything honorable, the other citizens are sure to follow th their example. And, where virtue has not the first place, their aristocracy cannot be firmly established. Those who have been at the expense of purchasing their places will be in the habit of repaying themselves, and it is absurd to suppose that a poor and honest man will be wanting to make gains, and that a lower stamp of man who has incurred a great expense will not. Wherefore they should rule who are able to rule best, and even if the legislator does not care to protect the good from poverty, he should at any rate secure leisure for them when in office. It would seem also to be a bad principle that the same person should hold many offices, which is a favorite practice among the Carthaginians, for one business is better done by one man. The legislator should see to this, and should not appoint the same person to be a flute-player and a shoemaker. Hence, where the state is large, it is more in accordance with both constitutional and with democratic principles that the offices of state should be distributed among many persons. For, as I said, this arrangement is fairer to all, and any action familiarized by repetition is better and sooner performed. We have a proof in military and naval matters. The duties of command and of obedience in both these services extend to all. The government of the Carthaginians is oligarchical, but they successfully escape the evils of oligarchy by enriching one portion of the people after another by sending them to their colonies. This is their panacea, and the means by which they give stability to the state. Accident favors them, but the legislator should be able to provide against revolution without trusting to accidents. As things are, if any misfortune occurred and the bulk of the subjects revolted, there would be no way of restoring peace by legal methods. Such is the character of the Lacedaemonian, Cretan, and Carthaginian constitutions, which are justly celebrated. End of section 11. Book Two, Section Twelve of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Two, Section Twelve. Of those who have treated of governments, some have never taken any part at all in public affairs, but have passed their lives in a private station. About most of them, what is worth telling, has already been told. Others have been lawgivers, either in their own or in foreign cities, whose affairs they have administered. And of these, some have only made laws, others have framed constitutions. For example, Lycurgus and Solon did both. Of the Lacedaemonian constitution I have already spoken. As to Solon, he is thought by some to have been a good legislator, who put an end to the exclusiveness of the oligarchy, emancipated the people, established the ancient Athenian democracy, and harmonized the different elements of the state. According to their view, the Council of Areopagus was an oligarchical element, the elected magistracy aristocratical, and the courts of law democratical. 
The truth seems to be that the council and the elected magistracy existed before the time of Solon and were retained by him, but that he formed the courts of law out of the citizens, thus creating the democracy, which is the very reason why he is sometimes blamed. For in giving the supreme power to the law courts, which are elected by lot, he is thought to have destroyed the non-democratic element. When the law courts grew powerful, to please the people who were now playing the tyrant, the old constitution was changed into the existing democracy. Ephialtes and Pericles curtailed the power of the Areopagus. Pericles also instituted the payment of the juries, and thus every demagogue in turn increased the power of the democracy until it became what we now see. All this is true, it seems, however, to be the result of circumstances, and not to have been intended by Solon. For the people, having been instrumental in gaining the empire of the sea in the Persian War, began to get a notion of itself, and followed worthless demagogues, whom the better class opposed. Solon himself appears to have given the Athenians only that power of electing to offices and calling to account the magistrates, which was absolutely necessary, for without it they would have been in a state of slavery and enmity to the government. All the magistrates he appointed from the nobles and the men of wealth, that is to say from the Pentecostio Medini, or from the class called Zugitie, or from a third class of so-called knights or cavalry. The fourth class were laborers, who had no share in any magistracy. Mere legislators were Zeleucus, who gave laws to the Epizephron, Locrians, and Chirondas, who legislated for his own city of Catana, and for the other Chalcidian cities in Italy and Sicily. Some people attempt to make out that Onomocritus was the first person who had any special skill in legislation, and that he, although a Locrian by birth, was trained in Crete, where he lived in the exercise of his prophetic art, that Thales was his companion, and that Lycurgus and Zeleucus were disciples of Thales, as Charondas was of Zeleucus, but their account is quite inconsistent with chronology. There was also Philolaus, the Corinthian, who gave laws to the Thebans. This Philolaus was one of the family of the Bacchiadae, and a lover of Diocles, the Olympic victor, who left Corinth in horror of the incestuous passion which his mother, Halcyone, had conceived for him, and retired to Thebes, where the two friends together ended their days. The inhabitants still point out their tombs, which are in full view of one another, but one is visible from the Corinthian territory, the other not. Tradition says the two friends arranged them thus, Diocles out of horror of, at his misfortunes, so that the land of Corinth might not be visible from his tomb, Philodos that it might. This is the reason why they settled at Thebes, and so Philodos legislated for the Thebans, and, besides some other enactments, gave them laws about the procreation of children, which they call the laws of adoption. These laws were peculiar to him, and were intended to preserve the number of the lots. In the legislation of Carondas there is nothing more remarkable, except the suits against false witnesses. He is the first who instituted denunciation for perjury. His laws are more exact and more precisely expressed than even those of our modern legislators. Characteristic of Thales is the equalization of property, of Plato, the community of women, children, and property, the common meals of women, and the law about drinking, that the sober shall be masters of the feast, also the training of soldiers to acquire by practice equal skill with both hands, so that one should be as useful as the other. Draco has left laws, but he adopted them to a constitution which already existed, and there is no peculiarity in them which is worth mentioning, except the greatness and severity of the punishments. Pittacus, too, was only a lawgiver, and not the author of a constitution. He has a law which is peculiar to him, that if a drunken man do something wrong, he shall be more heavily punished than if he were sober. He looked not to the excuse which might be offered for the drunkard, but only to expediency, for drunken more often than sober people commit acts of violence. Androdamus of Regium gave laws to the Chalcidians of Thrace. Some of them relate to homicide and to heiresses, but there is nothing remarkable in them. And here let us conclude our inquiry into the various constitutions which either actually exist or have been devised by theorists. 
End of Book Two, Sections Eleven and Twelve. Recording by Jennifer, Hilo, Hawaii. End of Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Three, Sections One through Four of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Three, Sections One through Four. Book Three, One. He who would inquire into the essence and attributes of the various kinds of governments must first of all determine what is a state. At present this is a disputed question. Some say that the state has done a certain act, others, no, not the state, but the oligarchy or the tyrant, and the legislator or statesman is concerned entirely with the state, a constitution or government being an arrangement of the inhabitants of a state. But a state is a composite like any other whole made up of many parts, these are the citizens who compose it. It is evident, therefore, that we must begin by asking, who is the citizen, and what is the meaning of the term? For here again there may be a difference of opinion. He who is a citizen in a democracy will not often be a citizen in an oligarchy. Leaving out of consideration those who have been made citizens, or have obtained the name of citizen any other accidental manner, we may say first that a citizen is not a citizen because he lives in a certain place, for resident aliens and slaves share in the place, nor is he a citizen who has no legal right except that of suing and being sued, for this right may be enjoyed under the provisions of a treaty. Nay, resident aliens in many places do not possess even such rights completely, for they are obliged to have a patron, so that they do but imperfectly participate in citizenship and we call them citizens only in a qualified sense, as we might apply the term to children who are too young to be on the register, or to old men who have been relieved from state duties. Of these we do not say simply that they are citizens, but add in the one case that they are not of age, and in the other that they are past the age, or something of that sort. The precise expression is immaterial, for our meaning is clear." Similar difficulties to those which I have mentioned may be raised and answered about deprived citizens and exiles. But the citizen whom we are seeking to define is a citizen in the strictest sense, against whom no such exception can be taken, and his special characteristic is that he shares in the administration of justice, and in offices. Now, of offices some are discontinuous, and the same persons are not allowed to hold them twice or can only hold them after a fixed interval. Others have no limit of time, for example, the office of a die-cast or ecclesiast. It may indeed be argued that these are not magistrates at all, and that their functions give them no share in the government. But surely it is ridiculous to say that those who have the power do not govern. Let us not dwell further upon this, which is a purely verbal question. What we want is a common term including both die-cast and ecclesiast. Let us, for the sake of distinction, call it indefinite office, and we will assume that those who share in such office are citizens. This is the most comprehensive definition of a citizen, and best suits all those who are generally so called. But we must not forget that things of which the underlying principles differ in kind, one of them being first, another second, another third, have, when regarded in this relation, nothing, or hardly anything, worth mentioning in common. Now we see that governments differ in kind, and that some of them are prior, and that others are posterior. Those which are faulty or perverted are necessarily posterior to those which are perfect. What we mean by perversion will be hereafter explained. The citizen, then, of necessity differs under each form of government, and our definition is best adapted to the citizen of a democracy, but not necessarily to other states. For in some states the people are not acknowledged nor have they any regular assembly, but only extraordinary ones, 
and suits are distributed by sections among the magistrates. At Lacedaemon, for instance, the ephors determined suits about contracts, which they distribute among themselves, while the elders are judges of homicide, and other causes are decided by other magistrates. A similar principle prevails at Carthage, where certain magistrates decide all causes. We may indeed modify our definition of the citizen so as to include these states. In them it is the holder of a definite, not of an indefinite office, who legislates and judges, and to some or all such holders of definite offices is reserved the right of deliberating or judging about some things or about all things. The conception of the citizen now begins to clear up. He who has the power to take part in the deliberative or judicial administration of any state is said by us to be a citizen of that state, and speaking generally, a state is a body of citizens sufficing for the purposes of life. 2. But in practice a citizen is defined to be one of whom both the parents are citizens. Others insist on going further back, say, to two or three or more ancestors. This is a short and practical definition, but there are some who raise the further question. How can this third or fourth ancestor come to be a citizen? Gorgias of Leontini, partly because he was in a difficulty, partly in irony, said, Mortars are what is made by the mortar-makers, and the citizens of Larissa are those who are made by the magistrates, for it is their trade to make Larissians. Yet the question is really simple, for if, according to the definition just given, they shared in the government, they were citizens. This is a better definition than the other, for the words, born of a father or mother who is a citizen, cannot possibly apply to the first inhabitants or founders of a state. There is a greater difficulty in the case of those who have been made citizens after a revolution, as by Cleisthenes at Athens after the expulsion of the tyrants, for he enrolled in tribes many medics, both strangers and slaves. The doubt in these cases is, not who is, but whether he is ought to be a citizen, and there will still be a furthering state, whether a certain act is or is not an act of the state, for what ought not to be is what is false. Now, there are some who hold office, and yet ought not to hold office, whom we describe as ruling, but ruling unjustly. And the citizen was defined by the fact of his holding some kind of rule or office. He who holds a judicial or legislative office fulfills our definition of a citizen. It is evident, therefore, that the citizens about whom the doubt has arisen must be called citizens. 3. Whether they ought to be so or not is a question which is bound up with the previous inquiry. For a parallel question is raised respecting the state, whether a certain act is or is not an act of the state. For example, in the transition from an oligarchy or a tyranny to a democracy. In such cases, persons refuse to fulfill their contracts or any other obligations on the grounds that the tyrant, and not the state, contracted them. They argue that some constitutions are established by force, and not for the sake of the common good. But this would apply equally to democracies, for they too may be founded on violence, and then the acts of democracy will be neither more nor less acts of the state, in question, than those of an oligarchy or of a tyranny. This question runs up into another. On what principles shall we ever say that the state is the same or different? It would be a very superficial view which considered only the place and the inhabitants, for the soil and the population may be separated, and some of the inhabitants may live in one place and some in another. This, however, is not a very serious difficulty. We need only remark that the word state is ambiguous. It is further asked, when are men, living in the same place, to be regarded as a single city? What is the limit? Certainly not the wall of the city, for you might surround all Peloponnesus with a wall. Like this, we may say, is Babylon, and every city that has the compass of a nation rather than a city. Babylon, they say, had been taken for three days before some part of the inhabitants became aware of the fact. This difficulty may, however, with advantage, be deferred to another occasion. The statesman has to consider the size of the state, and whether it should consist of more than one nation or not. Again, shall we say that while the race of inhabitants, as well as their place of abode, remain the same, the city is also the same, although the citizens are always dying and being born, as we call rivers and fountains the same, although the water is always flowing away and coming again? 
or shall we say that the generations of men, like the rivers, are the same, but that the state changes? For, since the state is a partnership, and is a partnership of citizens in a constitution, when the form of government changes, and becomes different, then it may be supposed that the state is no longer the same, just as a tragic differs from a comic chorus, although the members of both may be identical. And in this manner we speak of every union or composition of elements as different when the form of their composition alters. For example, a scale containing the same sounds is said to be different, accordingly as the Dorian or the Phrygian model is employed. And if this is true, it is evident that the sameness of the state consists chiefly in the sameness of the Constitution, and it may be called or not called by the same name, whether the inhabitants are the same or entirely different. It is quite another question whether a state ought or ought not to fulfill engagements when the form of government changes. 4. There is a point nearly allied to the preceding, whether the virtue of a good man and a good citizen is the same or not. But before entering on this discussion, we must certainly first obtain some general notion of the virtue of the citizen. Like the sailor, the citizen is a member of the community. Now, sailors have different functions, for one of them is a rower, another a pilot, and a third a lookout man. A fourth is described by some similar term, and while the precise definition of each individual's virtue applies exclusively to him, there is, at the same time, a common definition applicable to them all. For they all of them have a common object, which is safety in navigation. Similarly, one citizen differs from another, but the salvation of the community is the common business of them all. This community is the Constitution. The virtue of the citizen must therefore be relative to the Constitution of which he is a member. If, then, there are many forms of government, it is evident that there is not one single virtue of the good citizen, which is perfect virtue. Hence it is evident that the good citizen need not, of necessity, possess the virtue which makes a good man. The same question may also be approached by another road, from a consideration of the best constitution. If the state cannot be entirely composed of good men, and yet each citizen is expected to do his own business well, and must therefore have virtue, still inasmuch as all the citizens cannot be alike, the virtue of the citizen and of the good man cannot coincide. All must have the virtue of the good citizen. Thus, and thus only, can the state be perfect. But they will not have the virtue of a good man, unless we assume that in the good state all the citizens must be good. Again, the state, as composed of unlikes, may be compared to the living being, as the first elements into which a living being is restored are soul and body, as soul is made up of rational principle and appetite, the family of husband and wife, property of master and slave, so of all these, as well as other dissimilar elements, the state is composed, and therefore the virtue of all the citizens cannot possibly be the same, any more than the excellence of the leader of a chorus is the same as that of the performer who stands by his side. I have said enough to show why the two kinds of virtue cannot be absolutely and always the same. But will there then be no case in which the virtue of the good citizen and the virtue of the good man coincide? To this we answer that the good ruler is a good and wise man, and he who would be a statesman must be a wise man. And some persons say that even the education of the ruler should be of a special kind, for are not the children of kings instructed in writing and military exercises? As Euripides says, no subtle arts for me, but what the state requires. As though there were a special education needed by a ruler. If, then, the virtue of a good ruler is the same as that of a good man, and we assume further that the subject is a citizen as well as the ruler, the virtue of the good citizen and the virtue of the good man cannot be absolutely the same, although in some cases they may be, for the virtue of a ruler differs from that of a citizen. It was the sense of this difference which made Jason say that he felt hungry when he was not a tyrant, meaning that he could not endure to live in a private station. But, on the other hand, it may be argued that men are praised for knowing both how to rule and how to obey, and he is said to be a citizen of approved virtue who is able to do both. Now, if we suppose the virtue of a good man to be that which rules, and the virtue of the citizen to include ruling and obeying, it cannot be said that they are equally worthy of praise. Since, then, it is sometimes thought that the ruler and the ruled must learn different things, and not the same, but that the citizen must know and share in them both, the inference is obvious. There is, indeed, the rule of a master, which is concerned with menial offices. 
the master need not know how to perform these, but may employ others in the execution of them. The other would be a degrading, and by the other I mean the power actually to do menial duties, which vary much in character and are executed by various classes of slaves, such, for example, as handicraftsmen, who, as their name signifies, live by the labor of their hands. Under these the mechanic is included. Hence, in ancient times, and among some nations, the working classes had no share in the government, a privilege which they only acquired under extreme democracy. Certainly the good man and the statesman and the good citizen ought not to learn the crafts of inferiors except for their own occasional use. If they habitually practice them, there will cease to be a distinction between master and slave. This is not the rule of which we are speaking, but there is a rule of another kind, which is exercised over freemen and equals by birth, a constitutional rule, which the ruler must learn by obeying, as he would learn the duties of a general of cavalry by being under the orders of a general of cavalry, or the duties of a general of infantry by being under the orders of a general of infantry, and by having had the command of a regiment and of a company. It has been well said that he who has never learned to obey cannot be a good commander. The two are not the same, but the good citizen ought to be capable of both. He should know how to govern like a freeman, and how to obey like a freeman. These are the virtues of a citizen. And, although the temperance and justice of a ruler are distinct from those of a subject, the virtue of a good man will include both. For the virtue of the good man who is free, and also a subject, e.g. his justice, will not be one but will comprise distinct kinds, the one qualifying him the rule, the other to obey, and differing as the temperance and courage of men and women differ. For a man would be thought a coward if he had no more courage than a courageous woman, and a woman would be thought loquacious if she imposed no more restraint on her conversation than the good man. And indeed their part in the management of the household is different, for the duty of the one is to acquire, and of the other to preserve. Practical wisdom only is characteristic of the ruler. It would seem that all other virtues must equally belong to ruler and subject. The virtue of the subject is certainly not wisdom, but only true opinion. He may be compared to the maker of the flute, while his master is like the flute player or user of the flute. From these considerations may be gathered that the answer to the question, whether the virtue of the good man is the same as that of the good citizen, or different, and how far are the same, and how far different. End of Book 3, Sections 1 through 4book 3 sections 5 through 9 of politics by aristotle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org politics by aristotle translated by benjamin jowett book 3 sections 5 through 9 5 there still remains one more question about the citizen. Is he only a true citizen who has a share of office, or is the mechanic to be included? If they who hold no office are to be deemed citizens, not every citizen can have this virtue of ruling and obeying, for this man is a citizen. And if none of the lower class are citizens, in which part of the state are they to be placed? For they are not resident aliens, and they are not foreigners. May we not reply that as far as this objection goes there is no more absurdity in excluding them than in excluding slaves and freedmen from any of the above-mentioned classes? It must be admitted that we cannot consider all those to be citizens who are necessary to the existence of the state. For example, children are not citizen equally with grown-up men, who are citizens absolutely, but children, not being grown-up, are only citizens on a certain assumption. Nay, in ancient times, and among some nations, the artisan class were slaves or foreigners, and therefore the majority of them are so now. The best form of state will not admit them to citizenship, but if they are admitted, then our definition of the virtue of a citizen will not apply to every citizen, nor to every free man as such, but only to those who are freed from necessary services. The necessary people are either slaves who minister to the wants of individuals, or mechanics and laborers who are the servants of the community. These reflections carried a little further will explain their position, and, indeed, what has been said already is of itself, when understood, explanation enough. 
since there are many forms of government, there must be many varieties of citizen, and especially of citizens who are subjects, so that under some governments the mechanic and the laborer will be citizens, but not in others, as, for example, in aristocracy, or the so-called government of the best, if there be such an one, in which honors are given according to virtue and merit, for no man can practice virtue who is living the life of a mechanic or laborer. In oligarchies the qualification for office is high, and therefore no laborer can ever be a citizen, but a mechanic may, for an actual majority of them are rich. At Thebes there was a law that no man could hold office who had not retired from business for ten years. But in many states the law goes to the length of admitting aliens, for in some democracies a man is a citizen though his mother only be a citizen, and a similar principle is applied to illegitimate children. The law is relaxed when there is a dearth of population. But when the number of citizens increases, first the children of a male or a female slave are excluded, then those whose mothers only are citizens, and at last the right of citizenship is confined to those whose fathers and mothers are both citizens. Hence, as is evident, there are different kinds of citizens, and he is a citizen in the highest sense who shares in the honors of the state. Compare Homer's words, like some dishonored stranger, he who is excluded from the honors of the state is no better than an alien. But when his exclusion is concealed, then the object is that the privileged class may deceive their fellow inhabitants. As to the question whether the virtue of the good man is the same as that of the good citizen, the considerations already adduced prove that in some states the good man and the good citizen are the same, and in others different. When they are the same, it is not every citizen who is a good man, but only the statesmen and those who have or may have, alone or in conjunction with others, the conduct of public affairs. 6. Having determined these questions, we have next to consider whether there is only one form of government, or many, and if many, what they are, and how many, and what are the differences between them. A constitution is the arrangement of magistracies in a state, especially of the highest of all. The government is everywhere sovereign in the state, and the constitution is in fact the government. For example, in democracies the people are supreme, but in oligarchies the few, and therefore we say that these two forms of government are also different, and so in other cases. First, let us consider what is the purpose of a state, and how many forms of government there are by which human society is regulated. We have already said that in the first part of this treatise, when discussing household management and the rule of a master, that man is by nature a political animal. And, therefore, men, even when they do not require one another's help, desire to live together, not but that they are also brought together by their common interests in proportion, as they severally attain to any measure of well-being. This is certainly the chief end, both of individuals and of states and also for the sake of mere life, in which there is possibly some noble element, so long as the evils of existence do not greatly overbalance the good, mankind meet together and maintain the political community. And we see that men cling to life even at the cost of enduring great misfortune, seeming to find in life a natural sweetness and happiness. There is no difficulty in distinguishing the various kinds of authority, they have been defined already in discussions outside the school. The rule of a master, although the slave by nature and the master by nature have in reality the same interests, is nevertheless exercised primarily with a view to the interests of the master, but accidentally considers the slave, since, if the slave perish, the rule of the master perishes with him. On the other hand, the government of a wife and children and of a household, which we have called household management, is exercised in the first instance for the good of the governed, or for the common good of both parties, but essentially for the good of the governed, as we see to be the case in medicine, gymnastic, and the arts in general, which are only accidentally concerned with the good of the artists themselves. For there is no reason why the trainer may not sometimes practice gymnastics, and the helmsman is always one of the crew. The trainer or the helmsman considers the good of those committed to his care, but, when he is one of the persons taken care of, he accidentally participates in the advantage, for the helmsman is also a sailor, and the trainer becomes one of those in training. 
and so in politics. When the state is framed upon the principle of equality and likeness, the citizens think that they ought to hold office by turns. Formerly, as is natural, every one would take his turn of service, and then again somebody else would look after his interest, just as he, while in office, had looked after theirs. But nowadays, for the sake of the advantage which is to be gained from the public revenues and from office, men want to be always in office. One might imagine that the rulers, being sickly, were only kept in health while they continued in office. In that case we may be sure that they would be hunting after places. The conclusion is evident, that governments which have a regard to the common interest are constituted in accordance with strict principles of justice, and are therefore true forms. But those which regard only the interest of the rulers are all defective and perverted forms, for they are despotic, whereas a state is a community of free men. 7. Having determined these points, we have next to consider how many forms of government there are, and what they are, and in the first place what are the true forms, for when they are determined the perversions of them will at once be apparent. The words constitution and government have the same meaning, and the government, which is the supreme authority in states, must be in the hands of one, or of a few, or of the many. The true forms of government, therefore, are those in which the one, or the few, or the many govern with a view to the common interest, but governments which rule with a view to the private interest, whether of the one, or of the few, or of the many, are perversions. For the members of a state, if they are truly citizens, ought to participate in its advantages. Of forms of government in which one rules, we call that which regards the common interests, kingship, or royalty, that in which more than one, but not many, rule, aristocracy, and it is so called, either because the rulers are the best men, or because they have at heart the best interests of the state and of the citizens. But when the citizens at large administer the state for the common interest, the government is called by the generic name, a constitution. And there is a reason for this use of language. One men or a few may excel in virtue, but as the number increases it becomes more difficult for them to attain perfection in every kind of virtue, though they may in military virtue, for this is found in the masses. Hence, in a constitutional government, the fighting men have the supreme power, and those who possess arms are the citizens. Of the above-mentioned forms, the perversions are as follows. Of royalty, tyranny. Of aristocracy, oligarchy. Of constitutional government, democracy. For a tyranny is a kind of monarchy which has in view the interests of the monarch only. Oligarchy has in view the interests of the wealthy, democracy of the needy, none of them the common good of all. 8. But there are difficulties about these forms of government, and it will therefore be necessary to state a little more at length the nature of each. For he who would make a philosophical study of the various sciences, and does not regard practice only, ought not to overlook or omit anything, but to set forth the truth in every particular. Tyranny, as I was saying, is monarchy exercising the rule of a master over the political society. Oligarchy is when men of property have the government in their hands. Democracy, the opposite, when the indigent, and not the men of property, are the rulers. And here arises the first of our difficulties, and it relates to the distinction drawn. For democracy is said to be the government of the many. But what if the many are men of property, and have the power in their hands? In like manner oligarchy is said to be the government of the few, but what if the poor are fewer than the rich, and have the power in their hands because they are the stronger? In these cases the distinction which we have drawn between these different forms of government would no longer hold good. Suppose once more that we add wealth to the few and poverty to the many, and name the governments accordingly. An oligarchy is said to be that in which the few and the wealthy, and a democracy that in which the many and the poor are the rulers, there will still be a difficulty. For, if the only forms of government are the ones already mentioned, how shall we describe those other governments also, just mentioned by us, in which the rich are the more numerous and the poor are the fewer, and both govern in their respective states? The argument seems to show that, whether in oligarchies or in democracies, the number of the governing body, whether the greater number, as in a democracy, 
or the smaller number, as in an oligarchy, is an accident due to the fact that the rich everywhere are few, and the poor numerous. But if so, there is a misapprehension of the causes of the difference between them. For the real difference between democracy and oligarchy is poverty and wealth. Wherever men rule by reason of their wealth, whether they be few or many, that is an oligarchy, and where the poor rule, that is a democracy. But as a fact the rich are few and the poor many, for few are well to do, whereas freedom is enjoyed by all, and wealth and freedom are the grounds on which the oligarchical and democratical parties respectively claim power in the state. 9. Let us begin by considering the common definitions of oligarchy and democracy, and what is justice oligarchical and democratical. For all men cling to justice of some kind, but their conceptions are imperfect, and they do not express the whole idea. For example, justice is thought by them to be, and is, equality. Equality not, however, for every one, but only for equals. And equality is thought to be, and is, justice. Neither is this for all, but only for unequals. When the persons are omitted, then men judge erroneously. The reason is that they are passing judgment on themselves, and most people are bad judges in their own case. And whereas justice implies a relation to persons as well as to things, and a just distribution, as I have already said in the ethics, implies the same ratio between the persons and between the things. They agree about the equality of the things, but dispute about the equality of the persons, chiefly for the reason which I have just given, because they are bad judges in their own affairs, and secondly, because both the parties to the argument are speaking of a limited and partial justice, but imagine themselves to be speaking of absolute justice. For the one party, if they are unequal in one respect, for example wealth, consider themselves to be unequal in all, and the other party, if they are equal in one respect, for example free birth, consider themselves to be equal in all. But they leave out the capital point. For if men met and associated out of regard to wealth only, their share in the state would be proportioned to their property, and the oligarchical doctrine would seem to carry the day. It would not be just that he who paid one mina should have the same share of a hundred minae, whether of the principal or of the profits, as he who paid the remaining ninety-nine. But a state exists for the sake of a good life, and not for the sake of life only. If life only were the object, slaves and brute animals might form a state, but they cannot, for they have no share in happiness or in a life of free choice. Nor does a state exist for the sake of alliance and security from injustice, nor yet for the sake of exchange and mutual intercourse, for then the Tyrrhenians and the Carthaginians, and all who have commercial treaties with one another, would be the citizens of one state. True, they have agreements about imports, and engagements that they will do no wrong to one another, and written articles of alliance. But there are no magistrates common to the contracting parties who will enforce their engagements. Different states have each their own magistracies. Nor does one state take care that the citizens of the other are such as they ought to be, nor see that those who come under the terms of the treaty do no wrong or wickedness at all, but only that they do no injustice to one another. Whereas those who care for good government take into consideration virtue and vice in states. Whence it may be further inferred that virtue must be the care of a state which is truly so called, and not merely enjoys the name. For without this end the community becomes a mere alliance, which differs only in place from alliances of which the members live apart, and law is only a convention, a surety to one another of justice, as the sophist Lycophron says, and has no real power to make the citizens. This is obvious, for suppose distinct places, such as Corinth and Megara, to be brought together so that their walls touched, still they would not be one city, not even if the citizens had the right to intermarry, which is one of the rights peculiarly characteristic of states. Again, if men dwelt at a distance from one another, but not so far off as to have no intercourse, and there were laws among them that they should not wrong each other in their exchanges, neither would this be a state. Let us suppose that one man is a carpenter, another a husbandman, another a shoemaker, and so on, and that their number is ten thousand. Nevertheless, if they have nothing in common but exchange, alliance, and the like, that would not constitute a state. Why is this? 
surely not because they are at a distance from one another, for even supposing that such a community were to meet in one place, but that each man had a house of his own, which was in a manner his state, that they made alliance with one another, but only against evil doers, still an accurate thinker would not deem this to be a state, if their intercourse with one another was of the same character after as before their union. It is clear, then, that a state is not a mere society, having a common place, established for the prevention of mutual crime, and for the sake of exchange. These are the conditions without which a state cannot exist, but all of them together do not constitute a state, which is a community of families and aggregations of families in well-being, for the sake of a perfect and self-sufficing life. Such a community can only be established among those who live in the same place and intermarry. Hence arise in cities family connections, brotherhoods, common sacrifices, amusements, which draw men together. But these are created by friendship, for the will to live together is friendship. The end of the state is the good life, and these are the means toward it. And the state is the union of families and villages in a perfect and self-sufficing life, by which we mean a happy and honorable life. Our conclusion, then, is that political society exists for the sake of noble actions, and not of mere companionship. Hence they who contribute most to such a society have a greater share in it than those who have the same or a greater freedom or nobility of birth, but are inferior to them in political value, or than those who exceed them in wealth, but are surpassed by them in virtue. From what has been said it will be clearly seen that all the partisans of different forms of government speak of a part of justice only. End of Book 3, Sections 5 through 9